on it's still easy Welcome everybody to day two of Unfence the Future, taking down fortress conservation and its enduring legacy. Um, this is a virtual symposium with roundtable discussions, poetry, short films, and calls to action. Um, and it is organized by the Natural History Museum, which is a traveling and online museum for the movement. Um, with a mission to advance climate and environmental justice. Uh, it was launched by a collective of artists, activists, and scholars in 2014. Um, and my name is Becca Economopoulos. I'm the director of the Natural History Museum. I'm going to be your MC today, um, along with Steve Lyons, our research director for the Natural History Museum. We're so happy you could join us today. I would like to start uh, with some housekeeping. Um, as attendees, you're not going to have the ability to turn on your videos or microphones. Um, so if you'd like to share, please post in the chat. You'll want to make sure uh, in the chat settings, there's a little drop down that you choose everyone if you want your chats to be seen by everybody. Um, but otherwise, if you're having any technical issues or otherwise want to message directly um, our event tech uh, or the panelists, you can do that by selecting hosts and panelists. Um, you are going to receive a poll that's going to pop up at the end of each session. Um, so we love your feedback. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you'll be getting a survey from us as well. Um, we will also, never fear, send the entire chat transcript to you from both days of the symposium. Folks yesterday um, were really keen on wanting that. We will also be sending out a link to both days of uh, to recordings from both days of the symposium. Um, one last comment, uh, we do reserve the right to um, block or delete chat comments if people aren't behaving respectfully, so please do. Um, and uh, I think that's it for housekeeping. Um, I want to begin with some acknowledgments and thank yous. First off to our Natural History Museum uh, event team. There's Cal Moody behind the screen or behind the curtain um, from Alluvium Gatherings, who is your tech today. Um, Steve Lyons, I mentioned, our research director, uh, who put a lot of thought into the curation and framing of the symposium and panels. Um, Andrea Rolison, who's been um, incredibly helpful with all the logistics and production support. Jason Jones. Uh, with the curation and also our designers and illustrators, Christian Fleming and Josh Yoder. Um, this event is not possible without the support of the Henry Luce Foundation and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. So a big thank you to them. Um, at the beginning, you heard music from Leanne Betta Samasaki Simpson. Um, and throughout the symposium during the breaks, you're going to hear music from her critically acclaimed album, Theory of Ice. Um, she is a Michi Sagik Nishnabeg scholar, award-winning author, artist, um, and musician. Um, and her work really breaks open the intersections between politics, story, and song and felt appropriate um, for today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our partners and co-sponsors. There's the Center for the Humanities at CUNY Graduate Center in New York. Um, they've long resourced multi-sectoral, intersectional, humanities-rooted uh, work that is anchored in an environmental justice standpoint, um, as well as Survival International, a global organization that has for more than 50 years worked in partnership with indigenous peoples around the world to defend lives, lands, and livelihoods. Um, they are organizing tomorrow a um, in-person conference at the Center for the Humanities um, that will also be live streamed 
Um, and uh, we are co-sponsoring that. So where today's symposium focuses on decolonizing conservation uh, in the North American context, tomorrow will be focused on the global context with speakers from the continents of Africa and Asia um, and beyond. Um, and also uh, the day after their conference, uh, which you can uh, register for at ourlandournature.org. Um, they will be hosting a demonstration outside the Bronx Zoo in New York, where the Wildlife Conservation Society is headquartered. They're one of the world's largest or old, oldest conservation organizations. Um, but unfortunately have a long history and complicity in human rights abuses in the name of conservation uh, with some current projects. Um, I also want to acknowledge the inaugural cohort of Red Natural History Fellows. So the Natural History Museum recently launched uh, a new multi-year project called Red Natural History. Um, and these fellows are kicking off a two-year fellowship by publishing um, essays uh, they have written about um, what a vision uh, of a non-colonial, non-capitalist uh, natural history looks like and a vision for those fields um, to make change, both to redress colonial and environmental harms, but also um, really chart a path towards a just and safe future for all life on earth. Um, so these eight change makers are um, uh, activist scholars and practitioners who are um, from fields like critical geography and conservation science and museum practice and landscape architecture. Uh, and they are creating uh, over the next two years public scholarship and field uh, building or field pushing initiatives that can serve to accelerate change. So today's symposium um, is our Red Natural History launch event. Um, and, uh, and I believe we've put in the chat um, a link if you'd like to check out those essays. Um, a word on the symposium. Um, American born fortress conservation as a model was really incubated here in the early US national parks, um, though it has its antecedents in the enclosure of the commons in, in Europe uh, and in imperial expansion. Um, but it, it, it was incubated here and exported globally. It has largely been discredited from a scientific perspective since the 1970s. Um, that said, we continue to live in its world. Um, so the symposium explores the ways in which its logics endure in the practices, the policies, and the protocols of institutions of federal law, uh, conservation, and historic preservation. The title, Unfencing the Future, Taking Down Fortress Conservation and Its Enduring Legacy, was inspired by a recently published report called Unfencing the Future, Voices on How Indigenous and Non-Indigenous People and Organizations Can Work Together Toward Environmental and Conservation Goals. Um, we're gonna drop a link to that in the chat. Um, this report is by Hester Dillon. She's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and a principal of Four Rivers Consulting. Um, we were inspired uh, by her metaphor of the fence, which we take as a metaphor for colonial and capitalist ways of relating to the land, uh, representing or reinforcing a regime of uh, private property and ownership and control, um, and also the boundaries and borders that fences inscribe are sites often of criminalization and militarization. Um, and so this symposium asks what it means to unfence the future, particularly in the context of the overlapping and intensifying climate, economic, and extinction crises that we face today. 
Um, so yesterday we started with a session conservation by dispossession, uh, where we heard from historians um, and scholars about the entangled histories of colonialism, capitalism, conservation, and dispossession. Um, and then uh, there was a session called Indigenizing Conservation, where we heard from speakers who discussed their experiences and challenges and lessons learned from working in and around the conservation movement, um, as well as their visions for what it could look like to indigenize conservation. Um, so today, we'll switch to the next slide. Um, we are uh, going to hear from Suzanne Schoen Harjo. I'm going to introduce her in a second. Um, in our first session, uh, we'll be hearing from um, organizers, indigenous organizers from the greater Chaco region, uh, Oak Flat, uh, Arizona region, uh, and Alaska, who are working to stop extractive industrial development that threatens ancestral lands and waters and sacred places. Um, we will also uh, have creative interludes in between each session um, and uh, we'll be playing uh, Leanne Simpson's music then, um, but also in this first one hearing from Dene Ina at the Baskin artist and um, musician and climate justice activist Ruth Miller, um, who will do a participatory exercise um, that is a guided meditation through the eyes of the salmon. Um, and she will also show some of her art. Um, and then defending the sacred mom policy, we'll be hearing about the National Historic Preservation Act, the National Environmental uh, Protection Act, the Antiquities Act, and the ways in which existing policy and law um, uh, currently fails uh, by and large to, uh, to uphold tribal sovereignty and to protect um, places from extraction. Um, and then uh, we'll be exploring in that session um, opportunities to creatively leverage existing law or change it entirely. Um, we're going to then have a short film um, and our final discussion of the day, Unfencing the Future for the Storms to Come, um, uh, we'll look at the broader context of the climate emergency and the ways in which the logics of fortress conservation, uh, which create ultimately protected zones and sacrifice zones, uh, expands from the level of uh, parks to the level of the nation state uh, in the context of climate refugees and migration. So what does it mean then uh, to unfence the future? And what is the task of conservation, historic preservation, museum practice, and so on um, in supporting uh, a more just future for all? Um, so with that, I'm going to kick things over um, to Suzanne Schoen Harjo, who really to properly introduce her would take 10 minutes at a minimum. Um, Suzanne is a poet, a curator, a writer, a lecturer, um, a policy advocate. She's currently the president and executive director of Morningstar Institute, uh, which is a national indigenous rights organization devoted to preserving native traditions, lands, and cultures through research, curation, and advocacy. It is because of Suzanne that we have the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. It's because of Suzanne that we have legislation like the American Indian Religious Freedom Act and the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, com commonly called NAGPRA. Um, it is because of Suzanne and, and so many other people uh, that we have many sacred places that have been protected and, and more than 1 million acres of land have been returned uh, to Native peoples. And it's because of all these things and more that Suzanne received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2014, the highest civilian honor in the United States. Um, and it is also thanks to Suzanne that we're going to start day two of this symposium with some powerful poetry. Thank you, Suzanne, for all that you do 
And with that, I will turn it over to you to open the floor today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's so nice to see you again, Becca. Good morning to everyone. Good afternoon uh, here in the East Coast. I'm going to read a poem that is from a series of poems that I call the People's Poems. And it something I started a long, long time ago, and it's constantly updated. And um, if you don't hear what you're most familiar with, it may be because I'm not, um, but let me know and you might find yourself in a new one. This is called Sacred Ground. Eagles disappear into the sun, surrounded by light from the face of creation, then scream their way home with burning messages of mystery and power. Some are given to snake doctors and ants and turtles and salmon to heal the world with order and patience. Some are given to cardinals and butterflies and yellow medicine flowers to heal the world with joy, with love. Some are given to bears and buffalo and human peoples to heal the world with courage and prayer. Messages for holy places in the heart of Mother Earth, deep inside the old stone woman whose wrinkles are canyons, in the roaring waters and clear blue streams and bottomless lakes who take what they need, in the forests of grandfather cedars and mountains of grandmother sentinel rocks who counsel till dawn, messages for holy places where snow thunders warn and summer winds whisper, this is sacred ground. Sacred ground at spirit falls where small round stones have secrets that clear cutters can never discover. Sacred ground at Stepto Butte Power Mountain where wild roses and canola and grasslands dull the roar from microwave towers and screams of ponies in the night. Sacred ground at Mount Graham, where mountain spirit gone dance at home, where Apaches pray for a peaceful world invisible through Vatican telescopes. Sacred ground at Noahus, Holy Mountain, Giving Medicine Mountain, Bear Butte, Matopaha, where Cheyennes and Lakota hide from tourists to make medicine, to dress the trees in ermine tails and red tail hawk feathers and ribbons of prayers to the life givers. Sacred grounds at San Francisco Peaks, where Hopi, Diné, Apache, Wallapai, and Yavapai peoples pray and dodge ski bums, bottles, and yellow snow to settle the spirits where they walk. Sacred ground, where the falls are called Kootenai, Niagara, Snoqualmie, and Seven, where condo dwellers and hydro sellers cannot harness power at the centers of creation. Sacred ground at Echota, where even Teleco's dam engineers hear Chalagi voices through the burial waters. Sacred ground at Hickory ground, where long ago Kosalgi women shake shells, where Kusa songs sing for ancestors, where Hodulgi clears long lying, blinding fog, where wind, tree, wind frees time from tangles and snarls. 
sacred ground at Indian Island, Eel River, where hatcheted wheeler, where hatchet wielding white men did not spare small children at the we ought prayer for world renewal. Sacred ground at the cottonwood trees along Sand Creek where volunteer murderers skinned and dismembered even the unborn, the children and nursing mothers. Sacred ground along Chinley Creek, Canyon de Shea, where Kit Carson tor torched Diné homes and peach groves and forced surrender to the long walk to hell and back. Sacred ground at Sibicu Creek's willows and underbrush, where the spirit of the Sibicu medicine man shot during ceremony and axed while surviving moves and visions of Chiricahua and White Mountain Apache. Sacred ground. At Badger Two Medicine and mountains called Blue Sky and Chief, Long, Pyramid, Santa Rita's and South. and falls called Multnomah and Kootenai and, and Bernie Tusas. At Kohalave, Wakarusa wetlands, the Everglades and Puget Sound and lakes called Blue and Bear, Greater Great Oahe, Onondaga, Seven Stone Mother and Zuni where vision, quest, vision questers seek gifts of the spirit and wisdom of the ancestors, where fire clouds and walking waters stand guard. Sacred ground at the Maze and Kachan Indian Pass, at Rainbow Bridge, Medicine Hole and Medicine Wheel, at Wind Cave, Salt Mother, Black Mesa, and mountains called Badger Two Medicine, and all the doors to the passages of time, to sacred grounds of other worlds, where suns light the way for eagles to carry messages for fire on sacred ground. Naish Bado. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. That was beautiful and um, the perfect way to open the day and remind us what this is all about. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our first moderator, one of our Red Natural History Fellows, Kai Bosworth. He's a geographer and assistant professor at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. He's the author of Pipeline, Populism, Grassroots Environmentalism in the 20th, 21st Century, um, and he will be uh, facilitating the discussion, Exterminating Extraction. Take it away, Kai. Thanks, Becca. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm so excited to learn uh, and continue learning from all of our panelists and speakers today. Uh, as Becca mentioned, my name is Kai Bosworth. I'm coming from you today uh, from Richmond, Virginia, which I understand to be uh, the historic lands of the Powhatan Confederacy. But I grew up and, and lived for most of my life uh, in uh, a Chetty Shikoan territory, not too far from Bear Butte, as Suzanne just mentioned. Um, and uh, I'm really excited for today's panel, which, you know, the way that I have been trying to think about it is if this panel really tries to think about, you know, if we critique fortress conservation uh, as a model for protecting uh, ecology or environments, what then are our grounds for instead uh, protecting these spaces and places from resource extraction? Um, we know that uh, all around the world, um, indigenous, black, and other marginalized communities are being prospected for future mines, fossil fuel developments, um, and a variety of natural resource uh, extractive industries. 
and governments and states are currently trying to weigh the potential profitability of these developments against uh, the threats to environmental health and sacred spaces uh, that they seem to graft onto the landscape. Um, furthermore, a lot of these projects are being marketed as if they're for the green transition um, or premised on the fact that if we off offset one space for environmental protection, then it's okay to sacrifice some other spaces and people who live there um, elsewhere. Uh, but we know that uh, indigenous nations have been at the forefront of uh, struggles against the sort of vision um, for decades and centuries. And we've got some incredible uh, people here today to describe uh, some of these uh, contemporary struggles and, and what grounds their, their activism or water protection, land defense, and, and fights for indigenous sovereignty. Uh, so I'm going to um, just quickly uh, say the names of everyone who will be speaking today, and then I'll invite each of our speakers uh, in the same order to introduce themselves as they uh, as they wish to, and to, in some amount of detail, describe the struggles for sovereignty or land and water protection uh, that you've been involved in, and that uh, brings you to this conversation today. So our three speakers will be N.A. Begay, Executive Director of Native Movement in Alaska, Julia Faye Bernal, Executive Director of Pueblo Action Alliance, and Dr. Wenzler Nozi Sr., Founder of Apache Stronghold. I'll turn it over to N.A. first. So I'm Nabon Donatum. I um am I was uh, raised, born or uh, grew up on the Navajo reservation in northeastern Arizona and uh, currently reside on interior Alaska Dinat people's territory in the in, in Alaska in the far north. And I am uh calling in or zooming in today from Shitka Kwan uh, in Southeast Alaska, Klinket People's Territory, where we're um, celebrating through ceremony the return of the herring uh, with our partners, a uh, community group called Herring Protectors. I am the executive director at Native Movement. I come to this work through uh, community organizing for many years. I started out in my own community of uh, the Navajo Reservation and, and working in a group called, with a group called Black Mesa Water Coalition, uh, co-founded and um, directed that organization for a number of years. And, um, and then uh, found my way to Alaska by way of love and, um, have been the executive director at Native Movement here, which is focused on Alaska community organizing and, and um, was asked to step into this role a number of years ago and have been very honored to support support our relatives from throughout Alaska. The um, Alaska is a huge, huge area with uh, 200 and 29 federally recognized tribes and um, a lot of, of amazing emerging and long-term community organizing that's happening. And our organization has been, uh, um, is an organization that supports community organizing uh, through, an, through a number of ways, um, but we also do action and advocacy work <clears throat> around environmental justice, climate justice, and gender justice. And, um, and we do community education work that is a lot around, I think, the topics that we're talking about, which is um, building a shared history, building uh, the shared the shared knowledge from which we can partner with our collaborative organizations, many of which are, are in the conservation realm. And so often I see them, the, the um, allyship fall apart because we don't have a shared history. We don't, therefore, we don't have shared goals. And so um, it's a big part 
of what we believe is really important is to is to build that shared history. So I'm so uh, grateful to be here and be asked to to sit on this panel with some really amazing people. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Julia. Herkam, um, Hino Mankima, the Daikam Kitu Bab, the Toshe Toyai, uh, Hood of the Soya'a. Good evening or afternoon, morning, wherever you're um, zooming in from. My name is Julia Bernal. I am a um, tribal member of San Diego Pueblo. Um, here in the middle Rio Grande of New Mexico, um, but also have lineage to my Yuchi relatives in Oklahoma. And um, I'm just really grateful to be here today and be in space and community with, um, you know, not just the representatives, you know, speaking on behalf of the fights that they're um, they're working on, but of course, all of the community that it takes to address um, land extraction or um, water um, deprivation or, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is, um, I really believe in the, the power of solidarity and um, indigenous worldview being at the center of protecting, you know, what it, what we deem as sacred. And so uh, again, I'm the executive director for Pueblo Action Alliance. We're a small Pueblo um, grassroots organization led by women and femme and two-spirit Pueblo people in New, in so-called New Mexico. Um, and we have been organizing a lot of our efforts to address um, sacred site protection, but um, mainly also focusing on um, climate injustice, um, social and environmental injustice by the way of extractivism or other ways in which um, uh, our people, our cultural resources are exploited, you know, for, for um, global capitalism or transnational corporations. Um, and so we've been doing this work for some time now. Um, happy to be here to, you know, talk about um, how the Southwest really does play like a really large role in the global fight to address climate crisis. Um, and also really looking forward to talking about, um, you know, the type of organizing um, and grassroots uh, strategies that we've implemented in order to um, make really, you know, significant impact, whether it's with Chaco or false solutions or, you know, any, any other um, issues, water, um, water is going to be, or is actually a really large component to our, um, to our work here in the Southwest as well. So I'll go ahead and stop there and her can. Thank you so much. And Wensler. Uh, Wensler, I believe you're still muted. Okay, there, can you hear me? Okay, uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you uh, for being a part of this panel. Um, I guess, you know, being, 64 years old, you can imagine living on a reservation all my life and growing up with grandparents who would cry about going home one day. And as you just get older, you begin to uh, learn more, know more. And, uh, and for God willing, for how, however it happened, I got into the tribal council, uh, served, served as a councilman, eventually served as a chairman, where it enabled me to get into some uh, security records to read about what happened to our people. And which was really disturbing because it relates back to um, my fathers and grandfathers and so forth, and especially my mother, my mother who was raised by a grandmother from the 1800s. And so just putting that all together um, made me realize what was happening to our people. And on top of that, being raised in a spiritual way on the reservation and holding the oldest way together was, uh, I, I, I really believe was really crucial because what I tell people is that in the Southwest, we are old and we are new, meaning that we are old to our old ways yet and we're new to this new way. And uh, leading, you know, it's good to see Susan. I hadn't seen her for years. Uh, 
going back to the Mount Graham run, Mount Graham fight, you know, I got arrested on praying on a sacred mount, sacred mount, which really kind of gave me uh, the doorway of understanding the system and getting into the government also made me clearly see the picture more. And so, uh, I mean, I, I too was one of those in organizing, starting this and starting that. But then it got to the point where um, getting as old as I am, it reminds me of a Lakota man who I met when I was 23 years old when I was in Washington and helping him up the steps because Washington was gonna have a meeting about these very issues we talk about. And he was 75 years old. And so anyway, when we got into the meeting, I was, uh, it was just talk, that's all it was. It wasn't gonna do any, anything for Indian tribes. And so as I was departing, I ran into that old man again, heading back to his taxi cab. And he, again, like I said, he was 75 years old, 75 years old. And he was crying and he told me, he says, you know, I've been waiting all my life, 75 years. And I thought today was gonna be the day. And he just held my hand and he just told me, you know, I hope it's better for you, but you have to fight. You know, you, you have to really fight. And like I said, that's when I was about 20, three years old, 22, 23, and I'm 64 now. And so I'm getting close to 75, the, the age of this man. And this is why it was so critical for me to go beyond these policies, beyond these procedures, and begin to fight the United States directly, because there's no other way. I mean, for me anyway, I'm, I'm getting close to that 75 years old, and I wanna be able to leave, leave a blueprint for our children of knowing how to fight this battle of capitalism and and, and colonization, but to also retain who we are. And that's why two and a half years ago, I, I wrote a letter to the United States uh, uh, telling them that I was uh, vacating the reservation and going home to our sacred lands and holy places where you ne neglect and also lie to our people. So I've been residing there for, for over two years now. And uh, you know now we're in this big fight with old flats uh, with the United States. And, um, you know, it's on the religion. And one of the things that uh, I seen that was really important that we hadn't battled the United States on is to protect the religious part because the religious part ties us to the land. And if, if they can cut us from our religion, then we're disconnected from the land. Because I see that happening here on our reservation to our people and how the assimilation uh, of what they brought here to, to brainwash us was really happening. And so, you know, my first step was to look at my reservation, challenge my people first, uh, who are we and where do we wanna be? And telling them we're at a crossroad and we have to make a decision. And so all those things were real critical because, you know, you need your people's support. You, you need their backing before, you know, for anyway, for me personally, before I went out to begin to reach out to across the country. So going to Europe, you know, sitting down to many white people of different nationalities, you know, African-Americans, Asians, and listening to them, because I have to under, we have to understand them if we want them to be a part of this fight and to know that we, we have the similar uh, uh, problem. Uh, so when it comes right down to it, you know, I tell them that you know, we feel this change on us of capitalism, colonization, detaching us from our, our base of community, family, and Mother Earth. And I tell them that, you know, the only difference between me and you is you were young, longer than we have. And so what Native people are doing now is making you realize that you have that and that you're, you're living in this colonized world and we're capitalism because that's what this country is all about because we here in Apache country can see it clearly. And so now we know how to fight this fight. Now we know what we have to go after. And that's why, you know, here in Arizona, you know, they, they're saying again that the Apaches are breaking the reservation and leaving. Well, we're going home, you know, basically is what our people done before who got killed, who got um, uh, in prison, you know, all these ugly things that happened to them, all they were doing was going home, you know, and just the same thing here, you know, all we're doing now is to go back and protect those religious and sacred places that makes up our identity and makes up the whole world. And this is why, you know, it's so crucial that we do what we're doing today and that we connect the way we are connecting. So anyway, that's what really, uh, well, some of the reasons that really brought me into this, this uh, mode of survival. Awesome. I mean, thanks so much. I'm, I'm so humbled to be uh, up here with you and so excited to ask you all um, so many questions. I'm going to try not to get ahead of myself. Um, so for 
you know, our listeners, there's several hundred people here uh, with us today um, who might not be familiar with the places that you're speaking from um, and these particular struggles. Um, I wanted to give you all the opportunity to talk about some of the, the recent uh, issues of water and land protection that you have all been involved in. Um, I know that Anais you know, worked on the uh, pebble mine, worked with folks uh, trying to stop that project, as well as more recently, Willow, Julia, there's all kinds of issues in Chaco, but let's start with with just throwing it right back to Wensler to explain the, the Oak Flat situation um, and uh, how you diagnose uh, what's going on there. Well, I guess, you know, your topic is water and land, and I'll, I'll try to stay specifically with that because, you know, there's so many variables involved in this fight. And so uh, I, I guess in the beginning, uh, like I mentioned at the University of Arizona to the lawsuits there is that, you know, some of these laws are good. Some of these laws are okay, but we have to be careful how they're mitigating and what they're doing and coming in. We have to have more of a clear understanding about what mitigation is, what consultation is, because that, from our experience, we, we see that used against us. And anything that you may not say is used against you. So one of the critical things I was telling them that is really to, to really understand the spiritual part of it, because if you do, then you understand the water and land issue. I said, so let me take you to the Amer America, I said, with, with the way they think corporate and the resources, is that one of the things that now I can't speak for, you know, the other places, but here in Arizona, we're dealing with copper mines. And the way the United States vacates those issues is by giving exemptions. And that's what we've been fighting is exemption. So when we go back to Mount Graham, Mount Graham was one of the first places that they exempt all environmental laws. And then now you have them following the same blueprint uh, with Oak Flats is, in, is exempting all environmental laws. And then the crazy thing here is you have a, a mining corporation who is foreign and with, with all these resources that they say they're gonna get is leaving this country. So anyway, you have to question the United States and their mind frame of what they think and what they believe. That's why it's so important that I told the students that you have to go back to the beginning to see how this country was founded. What was their mentality? What is still their mentality? Because if you look at the water and land issue, okay, the water is going to be totally contaminated. You know, you're talking about billions of water being contaminated. Then you go into the way the clouds move, the way the atmosphere, everything works. That's going to be all affected because once this pit opens up, 184 degrees is going to rise to the surface. So you're talking about 10 degrees hotter, 50 mile radius, and then billions of water destroyed. So when you come back to the Indian people, what we say here is that they give the, the example of a vehicle, the radiator, is that the radiator keeps the engine cool. And so if this water is going to be um, uh, uh, contaminated and also um, going to be taken out, then the top surface is going to get hot. So they're saying not only is it going to be 184 degrees, it's going to be hotter than that because everything, all the water of how it's supposed to interact with the earth is going to be destroyed. And so then when you come to the land, you're talking about the whole environmental, what God blessed the world to be from the time, like I say, that you could be, you could be born there and you could die there with old age. But exempting all these laws, you know, to, to not have the environment or the water through our voices, our people's voices, have a chance to say anything, it's totally taken away. And so here we are, we're in court, and we can't even use any of that. And, and, and so, you know, for, for our fight here in Arizona, it's really tying our hands and not able to use no laws that the United States has to protect the environment. And then on top of that, you know, you, you have the, the marketing skills that they have as far as saying jobs, you know, money, you know, for the state, for the country. And when you, when, you, when you really start researching that, you start tying into how people have invested. It. And so I'll give you an, an example. Like we have very big support uh, from New York, from this one organization, but they had to back out because they didn't know their 401ks were tied into the minerals. And then, so we find it, not only with them, we find it with different tribes too, that they, they're tied into, you know, these, these insurances and, and so forth that this is why some of them can't support the way they support. So the water and land issue is a very critical one. And one of the things that, you know, through my experience that I've found that, that has put this whole project to a, a halt 
is the fact that we have a religious tie to this place and, and we have to go home. We have to go back into these places because then it raises all the other questions again. And so, you know, for our fight here, um, it's been an unfair, unfair fight because we can't use none of those laws. And, but I think what has resonated from it because they wanted this at 2002, you know, we're, we're in 2023 and now, uh, uh, now all these questions are, be, are being um, brought up again. But now the big thing that we face is this so-called new energy. You know, because now they need more copper, they need lithium. That's where some of these other tribes in Nevada are fighting these fights because uh, it's the same companies involved with just different names. And so you have to really backtrack who these people are and how they're tied. But um, again, you know, we, we all know that without water, there's no life. You know, there, there's, there, it's a giver of life. And then the land issue here in Arizona, you know, the Southern part is gonna be contaminated. And right now we kind of sit like in a horseshoe and all the surrounding is nothing but minings and we sit right in the middle. And the only thing that is purely left is we're talking about old flats and the buildings of water that it contains and the way it controls the atmosphere, the clouds and the way they move, those moistures aren't gonna to get to where they normally get. So it's not gonna just be uh, in that local area that the land is gonna be affected, but many places, uh, other places will be affected. And so that's why we see a catastrophe happening. If this, if this mine goes through, if they win this fight, they have set precedents because number one, they detach us in their own laws that we have no spiritual connection like everybody else in this country. So that disconnects us from the water and the land. And that's for all native people. And that's why I've been asking native tribes to watch our case because that's exactly what they're talking about. And, and from there, it gives the rights to companies to be exempt from these very laws that some of them are good that can protect and can bring the reality to the forefront of what's gonna happen in these places of damages. And, and so if this goes, those things have set the uh, precedence of what's gonna be happening next. Because right now, from what we hear from the insides is that mining corporations, oil corporations that are like 90% owned from America, they're waiting for this court case to be done so that they can also submit uh, exemptions from the federal law. And it's gonna be a dam that's gonna break <laughs> And I don't know how they're gonna hold it back because politicians, you know, they're, they're tied to all of this stuff. We, we have very few good politicians, but the majority are not very good. The line in the water is not an issue for them at this point. And then to top it off here in Arizona, the important thing for the mining corporation is that they're buying every water, every partial water that they can buy, they're purchasing it. So in, in England, what they said was to their stockholders, the stockholders were worried about the future of their children. And now they're telling them that, you know, in America, we're, we're buying the water. We're, we're going to have the water source. And so, again, comes back to our congressional leaders in Washington that are even state. Nobody pays attention to this stuff. It's, it's far bigger than what we thought it was, you know. And, and so this is why, you know, when it comes to the water and land, it's so crucial that we all stand together, not just Native people, all people, because we're all going to be affected by this. And that's why in the Apache Stronghold, we... It was an Apache fight, native fight, you know, a state fight. Now it's a country fight because it, it's 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 in every avenue that affects every day of our life. Yeah, no, totally. I, I want to ask Julia to to go next, and you know, what about that resonates with you, and um, and the you know some of the situations in Chaco that you've been facing. Yes, thank you. Well, um, Winslow brings up really good points in terms of how um, colonialism is really that root of extractivism um, in, in various geographies. I feel like that um, is very similar in different, um, in different movements that are organizing to protect sacred landscapes, um, cultural landscapes, um, and just also the preservation for future generations. In the so-called Chaco region, the greater Chaco landscape, um, we have been facing 
um, a legacy, a historic legacy of colonialism by way of extractivism and um, the implementation of U.S. policy. So in, in to Winsler's point, in order for us to really understand um, colonial trends throughout generations, we have to know the history. So, um, for example, the um, first sort of wave of, of colonization um, throughout the U.S. was by physical genocide and the displacement um, of indigenous people and stealing land and, um, and, and water. Of course, that was met by um, strong indigenous resistance. And so colonialism then started to transform into policies. So in the, in, or um, the, the way in which the US government tried to assimilate indigenous peoples, like, well, you can't kill them, might as well try to change their um, spirituality or their system of thinking. Um, and that's another form of how colonialism is um, continuing to oppress our people. And then you now you have extractivism and the um, the the economic agenda to create surplus and contribute to global capitalism, consolidate wealth with very few. Um, and all of that does not really fit into the um, fit into the paradigm or the worldview of indigenous people. Um, we don't see land as profit or as property. We see land as a relative. Uh, we see water as a relative. And so there's literally just paradigms that just can't get along with each other and are combating each other. But again, I want to just reiterate that the reason why colonialism has been evolving is because there has been disruption by indigenous people, by frontline communities, by youth, um, you know, especially with a lot of the work that's been done around addressing climate crisis, um, we wouldn't get to where we're at now without youth climate action. And so um, we're, I think the big like meta question is just like, how do we like fully disrupt a, like a colonial or a neoliberal agenda, um, which I think is the work that many of us have been invested in. Of course, um, like Winsler said, most of most of his life has there's been that investment. And um, I think that's going to be the the take from a lot of indigenous led uh, movements is that this will be a lifelong investment of protecting what we hold sacred, protecting our culture, because um, without that love and respect for our traditional ways of life, um, we wouldn't be able to um, speak with you all about this worldview and how important it is to solve a lot of these global problems. And I really do feel like the work that has been done, um, like, you know, here in the so-called U.S. Um, is actually making that global impact. And so um, it's just been uh, a lot of um, I, what I've been finding most effective in this work is building um, international solidarity to learn about other people's fights across the globe. Um, because once you start learning about other people's struggles, you um, soon find that they um, mimic a lot of what, you know, your people or our people are going through. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's just so true. The And part of the reason is that these, these giant mining firms are international players. So, you know, Rio Tinto operates in Oak Flat and then in the Brazilian Amazon and then, you know, in Indonesia and, and so on. So, you know, despite the fact that these are place-based struggles that you're describing, there's also a sense that, um, that there's an international movement for the protection of, of sacred places that might be emerging as well that can learn from um, the, the struggles of the past um, and, and sort of apply them to the future. Um, and Ine, I want to give you a chance to talk about, you know, the potential victory at, at, of the stopping of the Pebble Mine and, and then some of the other projects that you've faced in and and you know folks you've been working with have faced in Alaska which is you know not oftentimes even thought about by North Americans in uh who live in southern climates you know farther south um 
you know, in what way are these struggles pushing back against the, the view of Alaska as a sacrifice zone and extractive territory um, that doesn't matter for uh, for the rest of us in, in some kind of ways? What way have, have these struggles been fighting for uh, for people everywhere? Hmm. Well, I mean, one first start with when I first came to Alaska, um, I, uh, get, like I said, I came by way of love. My partner is um, Netsai Gwichen from um, Arctic Village, Alaska. And I first came to that, to their village and was, um, there's no roads to the village. Um, Alaska's got a lot of rural communities that are not connected by road systems. And um, got off the plane and went fishing and that was dinner. Uh, because most of the most uh, rural uh, Alaska Native villages depend heavily on uh, hunting and fishing still. Uh, the cost of food, uh, the cost to ship food, uh, beef and whatnot from other areas is, is huge. The cost of a pound of beef in, in some of these villages is $30. $30 a pound or something for, for a cheap piece of steak um, or chicken. And, and so uh, every, the, the cycle of living with the land, um, of hunting, of fishing season, of berry picking, like that is, that is, it's critical and it's still in, it's still very much a way of life, right? Um, and in 1971, Congress passed a unilateral congressional reg, uh, legislation called the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act that um, was ha, has been a pretty critical piece of how colonialism has shaped out in Alaska, um, in which, uh, first of all, indigenous hunting and fishing rights were extinguished. And uh, in the second line or third line of Angska, it clearly states that this settling of Aboriginal title to the land is in order to make way for the uh, pipeline, oil pipeline. You know, settling, settling um, Aboriginal land title has always been, whether through violence or these um, uh, legislative acts, actually they're all violent. Um, has been about taking land and resources. And so Angska is, is a, has been a way of moving, um, an instant way of moving tribal membership into shareholder status. So Angska created uh, 13 regional corporations across Alaska, tw over 200 village corporations. And you still have though 229 federally recognized tribal governments in Alaska. Um, and so I often explain it like this, look, the, the regional corporations, they got access, they got the rights to subsurface mineral leasing. Not all of it, like they got, they divvied up the land and there's portion, large portions that went to 13 regional, well, the 13th corporation is based in Seattle. So 12 regional corporations with land holdings in Alaska. Um, that have the rights to subsurface leasing. The 200 village corporations have the rights to lease surface um, surface leases like gravel, trees. Um, but the tribes have the sovereign ability still. And that is, a, that is what is being debated continuously now. It's being fought over as recently as the CARES Act and, and going back. And um, because uh, corporations are, um, it's like, I often describe it as this, it's as though um, Exxon and Shell have the subsurface rights of all the, the, um, the globe, <laughs> we can argue if this is true or not, right? They have the, they have the right to tell off the subsurface leases and um, Amazon and um, well, maybe not Amazon, maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Some other corporations have the ability to, to lease the, the surface rights. And then our government 
simply ha has no land holdings technically, right, in, in legalities, but has the ability to negotiate as a sovereign nation. Um, and so that that's a huge way in which Alaska Native tribes have been dealt a blow in terms of their sovereign abilities, in terms of their land access. And I'll say not all tribes signed this. Um, there, were new, there were a number of tribes that did not sign on to ANSCA, um, including my partner's people. And and uh, it still went forward, right? This, like I said, this was a unilateral congressional uh, act that wasn't necessarily, a, it wasn't something that came to tribes for their um, their participation in developing. Um, so ANGSCA not only extinguished hunting and fishing rights, but it, it also just opened the way for instantaneous corporate takeover um, and turning, again, tribal membership into shareholders, which then began this process of, of dividing, right? There's a, there was a, began a division of values from a cultural place of tending of our stewardship to the land to the fact that as you're, as a corporation, you're, you're mandated to um, make profits for your shareholders. Um, and so that division is very clear. And I won't, I'm not all of the corporations are operating um, as resources entities or corporations trying to to find different ways of of building profits for their shareholders um and there are some corporations that are in much better uh, communication and alignment with tribal governments you don't tend to see most of the tribes still advocating for protection of their lands and their resources and their waters clean water and the animals because their communities are the ones that are relying heavily still on those those um, relationships with the land with the water with those animals um but we see in many cases um the tribes going to dc asking for no drilling in the arctic refuge or the willow uh, in the nuixic area where the willow project is being um, proposed by shell corporation or conoco phillips sorry you see the tribes going to dc asking for those places to be protected and then you and then at the same time, you have the corporate, the Angska Alaska Native corporations going to DC, asking for those lands to be open. So it has built this divide and conquer, conquer tactic, which is which is very real and also, um, yeah, it's very complicated. Uh, so Alaska has the uh, leadership of um, uh, our our governor and our various congressional delegates who have who have touted Alaska as a uh, resource extraction warehouse, a resource warehouse to the rest of the country. Um, and so you have places like the Arctic Refuge, like Willow being proposed for more and more oil and gas development. Um, you have roads to resources being developed, uh, being proposed, something like there's a number of number of roads being proposed to build, be built, not for people, um, because most of the tribes along those road, uh, proposed roads don't want roads to come in. They've seen the tribes that have been on the road system have been devastated, first of all, by like outside hunters that come in and take sport hunting or um, uh, increase social ills in their communities. So uh, Ambler Road is a proposed road that is going to be accessing critical minerals, quote unquote, critical medical minerals. Um, Donlin Gold Mine, which is going to be one of the largest open pit gold mines in the in the world, is being proposed in the Yupik territories of the Yukon Kuskokwim region. This is um, just north of where the uh, proposed Pebble Mine was to be put, and I think Pebble Mine is definitely. Um, uh, we work with a number of great groups, uh, one of them being the uh, United Tribes of Bristol Bay, who is critical in the closure of the Pebble Mine and uh, or the, the stopping of the Pebble Mine. And that was numerous tribes in that area who who worked together to uh, stop that mine from happening. Then, But then you, you go further south and you've got um, oil and gas development being being okayed by the Biden administration. Um, in the same act that's supposed that's providing climate, supposedly 
providing climate um, solutions in this country, uh, clearly sacrificing Alaska and the Cook Inlet for, for mandating oil and gas development. And then um, even further south in the southeast where I'm at, where there's numerous proposals for critical mine or more of these um, mineral development for um, both the expansion of military militarization, the um, creation of more fighter jets and whatnot, and now these renewable energy need that folks are are saying is our that that is being touted as like the climate solution is to create is to mine more to get more of these resources and i think you know as um renewable energies by any means necessary is not the solution right that does not get to the critical issue of colonialism and uh, if we're not addressing that issue then we're repeating the same um extractive uh uh history and and so we've got to think more critically about the solutions before us. And I think put leadership, following the leadership of indigenous peoples who have been um, in relationship with the land, whose ancestry has been in, in good relationship with the lands for thousands of years, is one of the key ways in which um, we need to take up that, that um, solution. I mean, there's uh, we need to invest in those leaders. Um, and I'm here in, in Shitka Kwan, where I think some of the most, some really powerful solutions are coming forward, and that is ceremony. Ceremony um, in, is a critical, and I dare say, critical strategy for how we're going to um, shift um, in what what is happening here is the remembrance and the recreation of that honoring of our relationships with the with the beings, with our ocean relatives, with the land relatives, the herring in this case. And the um the honoring of those relationships is not only um a healing for ourselves as wounded people, <laughs> right? We've got a lot of wounds through this history of colonization. There's a healing of our relationship with those rel relatives. And it, we're finding also as a way in which the the spirit of, of, of organizing is being furthered. It is it was so hard to keep this these fights up. Um, and so how are we tending to our energy? How are we ensuring that we're not burning out, that we're not just taking on more of the wounds? It really has to, I think, be hand in hand with ceremony. And um, and I think about the some of the, the prophecies of this time and that when I first met my partner and I brought him to um, Arizona, my auntie says, she just shakes me and she said, what are you doing? You're bringing about the end of the world because we have these sayings about the northern Athabascans and the southern Athabascans that we're related. We we migrate. We we roamed these lands thousands of years ago, right? Um, but so we still have stories about each other. And she said, "What are you doing? You're bringing about the end of the world when uh, the when the northern and the southern Athabascans." Um, come together, that's going to be the end of the world. And my grandfather, who's a medicine man he in, in Navajo, says, you know, don't listen to her. That's not it. It's that it's going to feel like the end of the world. It's a, These are indicators of the time that, that feel like the end of the world. But it's a huge, it's a transition. And, and so I think that in the moment, we're all left in this time of great transition. And I think picking up that that um, responsibility in a way that remembers that we are also deeply spiritual and ceremonial people and that is a that is a critical part of our just as as much as the lit litigation the halls of the legislations legislators um and and all of the the lockdowns and the protests is remembering to tend to our our spirit as well yeah Yeah, amazing. I mean, I think that, um, you know, one of the thing that's, things that's coming out of this conversation is that um, the, the 
projects and movements and and whatnot that you all are describing aren't isolated but part or part of these broader um broader emerging sort of threads um or or webs of of connection between and among folks who are trying to to usher this this transition into being um and to do it you know the right way um and yesterday I was just reflecting that Rosalind Lapierre reminded us how important, you know, it is to be really, really careful in thinking about the language and words that we're using to describe um, describe these sorts of shifts. Um, and so I wanted to, and this is an open question, anyone can pick it up to, um, yeah, really tell me, you know, um, I might describe these as, you know, on the negative side, the international system driven by plunder um, for profit um, off of land and labor um, that's symptomatic of capitalism and colonialism. Um, and I might describe the, the sort of opposing movements as, as indigenous led um, movements for sovereignty and land and water protection. Um, but those are just my, my assessments that I wonder, you know, what words and, and concepts do you use to describe? You've you all have been giving us wonderful, um, you know, ways of conceiving both of the reasons why capitalism and colonialism are at the heart of these these projects, these you know mining and, and extractive projects, as well as things like solidarity, ceremony, religion, transition, responsibility, and so on are are crucial to the the sorts of um alternative futures that that folks are trying to imagine and usher in um so yeah i don't know if anyone wants to riff off of of that um i would be interested to to hear what you think well i can just i can quickly just go into this um sort of grassroots narrative around no false solutions because um essentially the climate crisis is an opportunity for corporations to like continue capitalism continue um a neoliberal agenda and of course like in our inner circles we all understand that having like an anti-capitalist analysis um um understanding like what neoliberal agendas look like um like that to us makes sense but when talking to community it's how can we make these this type of information accessible and so i found that like talking about um corporate greenwashing as a false climate solution is an effective way to talk about how um the trickery and foolery around um you know um uh yeah, just around um, the way corporations talk about addressing issues is not going to solve the crisis. It's not going to um, um, address the ways in which climate is impacting us. I mean, like carbon footprint, that was a concept that was um, created by oil and gas corporations. Um, and so greenwashing is, um, and, the, and the conversation and narrative around false solutions has been that way to also talk about how, um, you know, pinning, um, climate impacts on the individual is not is ignoring the systemic and global institutions behind um, capitalism and colonialism. And so that's been something that we have been utilizing in our tool belt um, when, you know, talking to our community members and, um, you know, happy to talk more about that, but I'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks. Yeah, anyone else want to jump in? I was going to, um, since I had just talked, I was going to see if... <laughs> it's okay, there's only four of us. <laughs> but, uh, could you repeat the question, though, too? I mean, I think Julie... Yeah, had... if, if you or, or if an A or Wensler want to jump in, it's just, you know, what are the words that you all use to, to diagnose, you know, what you're facing and, and what we're fighting for? Well, I mean, I think our our panel has said it has said it clearly. I mean, colonialism is is a key root, and I think um, 
I was in some trainings at or some some international sessions and sessions with non-indigenous folks, and I think there was a, not a, um, as much of shared understanding or shared like and I think that that is that is a place that we um, as as global citizens need to to pick up um, our understanding around and really really. Um, also understand how each of us, whether in, whether we identify as indigenous or not, has been sh um, impacted by colonialism and harmed by colonialism. And I think um, uh, colonialism stems from that, in, in my view, all capitalism, uh, patriarchy, um, the, these ways in which we are, um, our relationships to each other as human beings uh, has been um, harmed through the, the the practices of colonialism. And, and, and so how then are we, how are we thinking about decolonization and, um, and, and, and an indigenized future, a future that um, doesn't, that disrupts a settler future, um, really, that really gets at um a future that is um not still entertaining the settler systems the colonial systems that be um you know i think i mean, that's a place that i get excited to Im imagine and vision and also seems sometimes really far away um when we're battling uh, it just seem like they'll never break and yet they've only been in place for such a small amount of time. In, in Alaska, the ANCSA, like I said, was passed in 1971. Um, and so, you know, I think some of these really horrible systems have been shaped, have been shaped very quickly um, by a few people. And so why cannot the same be true in on the other, right? And I think of course, greed and capitalism um, is a huge a part of that um and how how do we disrupt that uh the this ability for you a few people to make so much so much profits um i think part of it is us taking off the um taking off the helping our community to take off the blinders of what is possible also of taking off the blinders of of um um, with the divide and conquer tactics of keeping us separated from not seeing what is happening in the other community, in our other communities, um, it's it's so important for us to hear from one another, and then also so important for our um, allies and other our relatives of who are global citizens to really get active in that in that dismantling of these colonial systems and the re the building of indigenized um in, in an indigenized future hello go for it um i think that, that, that's a really uh great great question and i, I think that question um really goes out to every different race, you know, it, to combine it all together, you know, we're, we're not there in a solution. And I'll, I'm only speaking from my younger days when I used to sit, sit with a lot of the older people and in the transition that we we're going through, because locally here, um, our older people were worried about our children forgetting who they were. And also when we got into this money situation, then, we seem to change, you know, and that's one of the things that Geronimo talked about was that, you know, when we touch this, it's going to change us. And, and that was a scary time for our people. And, you know, today is reminding our children that, that, you know, you can go and get your education, but you can also be an enemy to your people. Because in the earlier days when assimilation was happening, that was happening to a lot of our children. And uh, uh, it really made an impact and so in the 60s and 70s was the time now to tell your children you know go you know be careful you know you you, you need to help here you need to 
to remember what's important that enough is enough don't don't become greedy don't don't want more and but i think you see that in all different races what happened when colonization and capitalism happened it became the focal point you know it became the center that everybody had to reach and that's why I say, you know, like when I look at America, it's just a mirage. You know, it's it's it's, it's based on a and a weak foundation. It's it, it's it's not real because it takes away us from all of that, and it gives us something that is just not real at all. And so that's a real crucial thing you're asking because that's the teaching that you tell within your family. You know what 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 you want to do with your family because uh, you know I, I have daughters who have degrees. And but one is here and one is doing everything she can, you know, within the community and within our ceremonies. And the other one, you know, had a different high salary, but she was unhappy because she detached herself. And so that's why her sister told her sister that, you know, you know, I, I just want to be happy. You know, I, I you know, I don't need the money to be happy is what God created the world to be. That's what dad keeps saying. But don't forget, that's what grandma said. You know, those are real crucial things. And so when that other daughter came back, um, they're both doing great work right now. They're in the front line, you know, pushing the, the Apache stronghold and running the whole thing without no pay. We, we, we get no pay and nothing in our organization. And it's what we contribute from our heart that you find pleasure. And then the reason why I say this is because like I'm at Old Flats and I, I get visits from many non-Indians and a lot of them are suffering, a lot of them hurting. And, and the one thing I can really point out about them is that a lot of it is their marriage and a lot of them marry for financial reasons and they don't marry the person they really love because of this world and what it requires. And so um, it's real sad, you know, cause you see how much corporate life plays an effect in all of us. And so we come to the point where, you know we have to understand when enough is enough. And sitting with a lot of the old people that I used to one of the things that they used to talk about was fear you know, how fear has been a part of this power and greed because now you're gonna suppress anybody and everybody. And it's just like, you look at this country right now, you know, in our, in our, in our oral argument in Pasadena, you know, the United States made it clear that every federal land and that's tribal land too, belongs to them and they, they'll do as well. You know, that means land and water, what you had asked before. And then if you look at the land base for what government holds is dwindling away, there's hardly anything. So. Before you know it, you're going to have a corporate country owning the world. So if you look ahead, it, it gets more dangerous, you know, of uh, uh, people actually owning this country rather than it's the way they say it's supposed to be built. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, the, I, I tell people I cross this country and I talk to whatever kids I can, because it's important that they grow with that moral integrity they, they, to the earth. And they understand that those decisions they're going to make, you know, varies big consequences to the future. And so, like it was told to me, you know, the only way we can uh, really get to the point of sustainability is that I have to reach back to the children. I have to reach back to the kids. So that's also not just Native kids. That's people across this country, because if, if we're on that same level, we, we can make a lot of great changes. And. Uh, again, you know, going back to Europe and sitting with many of the different countries there and learning about them is that they were, they were indigenous too. You know, they, they all had a culture, they all had a way. You know, so many people have come to Oak Flats, you know, over the years and Mount Graham have gone back home to Europe to retouch their base. And they come to find out that, you know, they, they have a culture, they have a prayer and how religion had suppressed their, their people. And then on top of that, they learned more about coming from their great, great grandparents who came to the East Coast, that a lot of them were forced into slavery too. And that a lot of them uh, were told to detach themselves from the European world and become this false American. And so it's really just being honest and truthful and sitting and talking with them that, you know, I think that's why in what's happening, what you see with the Apache Stronghold Hall, we're all across the country is because we're all in the same, you know, we're all in the same shoe. And, and it just takes me back to, you know, to the old people when they warn us about, you know, uh, wanting more and more and more and more. And, and that's what Resolution Copper here is saying, you know, when they talk about jobs, money, opportunities, uh, educational funds, scholarship, they talk about all these technology stuff. And 
in talking with one of them, he, he says that um, it's what the people want. You know, we're going to do it as long as the people want it. You know, so that's why I turn back to our people here that we got to be careful because it takes us back to that very beginning. That when we touch this ugliness, we're going to want more and more. But the important thing now is that, like, like it's told to me, that we, we become more like uh, disciples. Now Native people are out there, you know, touching the spirits and the souls of the people about mm-hmm. Mother Earth and about survival and about those yet to come. And so to me, you know, being the chairman, uh, going to Washington, learning about the judicial system, learning about the military system, you know, the political system, there's no way, there's no way. But what we do have is the heart and the mind. And, and that's one thing that I think, you know, that we all had at one time, but now it's important that Native people bring that back and feed these people. Because when you feed them, they'll stand with you. And it's really nice at Old Flats. You know, I, I, you know, I have my people and other tribes, but I have numerous of white people come stay the night and go into prayer, you know, and began to spread the word all over the country. About, about Mother Earth, because they, they do have a spirit too. But the way America has created this American way is that they have no spirit. I mean, we, that's a whole nother topic that happened in our yeah. world where uh, that, that, that white people don't have a spirit here, you know? And I was like blown away. And that's why so many religious groups are joining our fight now, because what happens to us, definitely they can do at will once the corporate owns this country 100%. And that's where it's going. And that's, mm. That's where the great evil sits. But anyway, I think that, you know, um, we, we, we all have to look in a mirror. And we, we will all have to make that decision. And I think with what we've been saying out there is putting the people to look at themselves. Because, you know, we need everybody to change this country and, and, and be the example for the rest of the world. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think that those are, are great words. We're out of out of time, and so we're going to have to end uh, this portion of the conservation. I wanted to thank our our panelists um, and be sure that uh, you um, all participants be able to look up some of the um, struggles and groups that that they've been involved in. Um, they're they've been posted in the chat, and we can repost them as well. Um, thanks to everyone for uh, the incredible words you've given us here today. Uh, so much to think about and, and uh, looking forward to the rest of the sessions here. Thank you so much, um, Julia, Ine, Wensler, and Kai. I'm feeling very moved um, by this panel. And um, thank you for your work to stop extraction, not only in your homelands, but everywhere, understanding extraction as um, of life, labor, and land as a colonial and capitalist worldview, practice, um, and paradigm that is fundamentally incommensurate with a just and safe future uh, for life on earth. And um, I love that question, Kai, about um, vocabularies because it occurs to me that, um, you know, that we're hearing um, from each of our speakers vocabularies that I don't hear much uh, of in conservation organizations, historic preservation contexts, museums, institutions of science. Wensler talked about fear. Um, And I feel like we all know these things. And my question is, um, are we ascribing enough power to us collectively to shift narratives, um, or are we holding back for fear? Each of our speakers are on the front lines, even putting their bodies on the line for their communities and for all of us and for the future generations. So I hope we find that courage um, to consider our vocabularies and the roots of the problems that we seek to address. Our next roundtable discussion is defending the sacred in law and policy. It starts at 3.45 p.m. Eastern. Um, But first, we're going to have a 15-minute creative interlude, and I am so excited to introduce Ruth Miller. Um, She is a Danaina Athabaskan artist, musician, and climate justice activist. Until recently, she served as the Climate Justice Director at Native Movement with INE. 
um, and she will be sharing with us some of her art um, and a guided meditation through the eyes of the salmon. Yeah, we do everyone and Chenan, Becca. Um, I so appreciate uh, having the opportunity to share with all of you, but first I really have to give my uh, deep, deep gratitude uh, to the panel that just spoke. Um, Ine is a, is a dear friend and auntie and collaborator and former boss of mine, um, and she uh, leads uh, so much of our Alaska movement with such deep integrity and grace, um, so it's really wonderful to be able to um, gather here virtually with you all. Uh, we are going to jump right in, and I really want to encourage folks, even though we're on virtually, to um, participate in this meditation. I used to be the type of person that would skip every meditation I could because I didn't have time and I was too stressed out, uh, but this is good for you. And so um, I'd like us all to sit back in our seats. If you're standing, if you need to get water, run to the bathroom, take care of your body in whatever way feels comfortable. Um, but if you can, uh, just sink into your body, you know, think about what it feels like to feel heavy in your chair or whatever setting is, is easeful for your body. And we're just going to take some deep breaths together. Let your eyes gently come to a close. Now, the meditation that we are about to move through um, was originally created by a Dena'ina sister of mine, Danielle Stickman, who um, shares ancestry with me. We are from the same village in Kijik on Kijnevena, Lake Clark. Um, she grew up in non-Dalton village and she has um, very generously allowed me to borrow this meditation and put a bit of my own touch on it. Um, so as we take those grounding breaths, I'm going to ask us to think about our toes dipping into cool water, lake water, fresh water. See if you can feel that water start to rise up beneath your feet. What does it feel like? Is it chilly? Has it been warmed by the sun? Is it frigid like it is here in Alaska where it's still snowing? And feel that water start to rise. Feel it reach your ankles, move across your calves and your shins. Maybe now it's at your knees. Is the water slippery? Is it smooth? As it comes up over your thighs and your hips, begin to feel yourself release into it, to dissolve into it, to melt into this clear, fresh, unpolluted, brilliant water that is our life. Now, maybe it's coming up across your navel, towards your rib cage, up to your shoulders. And as the water reaches your neck and begins to slip over your face and up towards the crown of your head. Allow yourself to become the water. Feel yourself as the water stretching out across this lake. What does it feel like to be water moving across sand? What does it feel like to be water moving across smooth stones that you have known for thousands and thousands and thousands of years? What does it feel like to tickle the grasses and reeds that grow at the bottom of the lake? What does it feel like to hold such abundance, to hold so much life within you? And we grow and we grow and we grow, stretching out to all the corners of this lake that we have become. And as we reach ourselves out, we also reach ourselves inward. So now we will ask our attention to come to the very, very small the tiniest pebbles, the littlest grains of sand that coat the bottom of our floor. And we come amongst some freshly spawned salmon eggs, some row. And as we approach these row that are shining bright and orange, maybe catching the daylight, let's enter them. Let's allow our consciousness to become this little egg. Feel your body as something small, but full and brimming with potential. Feel your body stretching into the sphere, ready to burst. Feel your body nestled and nurtured, knowing that you are safe amongst your siblings, feeling that cool water wash over your skin. And maybe we start to wiggle a little bit. 
Maybe we start to ask our fingers and hands to come alive. Maybe we start to move with the water as it brushes over us. And as we begin to wake up, come into your body. What does your body feel like as it's growing? Feel your bones grow, your smooth bones. Feel them stretch and elongate. Feel your smooth skin as it forms a sheen over it, slippery and slick in the water. Feel the abundance of food around you and the security knowing that you have exactly what you need to grow. And as your skin stretches, as your bones grow, as you get bigger and bigger, now is the age of play. Play with the water as you explore your surroundings. What does it look like around you? What is in the water around you? Do you see family? Do you see friends? Do you see familiar places? Is there something in you that has been here before that remembers this? You recall that thousands and thousands of generations of your ancestors have come to be birthed in this exact spot. And as you begin to play with the water, feel the pull that your exploration and your curiosity calls in you. Feel that pull out towards the ocean that you know is beyond the watershed. And as you begin to race towards that salt, that freedom, that great expanse that you know is waiting for you, feel that excitement fill you up, that life energy. Allow yourself to be pulled down river. Allow yourself to be pulled downstream. Allow yourself to reach the estuary where you know you will find abundant food. And finally, finally, you reach the ocean. Feel the weight of the other creatures around you that you recognize and know. Feel the excitement. Feel part of this great, great ecosystem and know that you have a place that is meant only for you. How does the water feel different here? What does the ocean feel like to you? Can you taste the salt on your tongue? Here is where we grow large. We build fat. We feel strong. What does your body feel like when it is strong, when you are well fed, when you have all the nourishment and nutrients you need? What does your body feel like? We stay here. We play. We feed. We experience. We are present and one with this great constellation of beings around us in this abundant ocean. But before long, we begin to hear the prayers calling us home, the prayers of our relatives that have asked us to rejoin them at the place of our birth. What does your home smell like? What smells do you associate with your home? What smells could ask you to? Retrace your steps to move back in time, to step into this new age and era of your life. Those are the smells that call you back along your ancestral route. Smell your way home as you move away from the ocean, as you embrace the age that has found you during this time. Follow your pathway home as you greet that estuary again as you greet the streams and rivers that you once excitedly bounded up. This is work and you feel yourself aging, but you know that there's nothing more important for you and for your relatives than to follow this pathway home. And as you come up the streams, you begin to think about all those generations of other salmon that have followed in this path. And you know what you are heading for. Before long, you see a familiar net and you see a fisherman standing there in the water. It was their prayers that were calling you home. It was those prayers that you were hearing. Remember the pact that you made with these people. Remember the love that you can feel from them even now. You say to them, Ucha den ina kishta shesh Say more to me in Dina'ina. 
Tell them, talk to me and dena'ina. This was the language that you once communicated in. This was the language that you each remember. Tell them, I came back to you. And they say to you, I am listening to you. And you allow yourself to be taken out of the water because you know that you will live on in the body of this family. And you know that in trade, for giving up your life in this way, for offering yourself to join their body, they will use their body to protect your home, to protect that water. Feel the gratitude and the prayers of the fishermen as they tenderly thank you, as they tenderly say, we love you, Salmon. Feel what a full belly feels like. Feel what that nourishment feels like and know that you have made the greatest gift to them. But it is not only a gift, it's a trade and that they will honor the trade that you made by protecting your watershed, by protecting your home. Maybe lastly, we'll become the raven, that has been watching from a nearby tree, maybe jealously, maybe feeling his own hunger. This raven, this is part of our creation story. The raven is cosmic. The raven is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And as the raven takes off from the branches of that aspen and begins to fly across the lake, you see the healthy ecosystem. You see the abundant trees, the life that is thriving. You see the balance and the harmony that exists in this place. You feel how deeply the love runs so strong that you know this place will always be fought for, protected from threat. You know that there's nothing that you wouldn't do as raven or salmon or fisherman to protect this place that you love so deeply. And as we see the water, as we see the land, the tundra and the tussocks, breathe in that fresh, clean air. Take one deep breath. Feel the air around you. Take another deep breath. And on this third deep breath, we open our eyes again and come back to Zoom. Shanan Khali, everyone, for following along, for those that actually did it. I really appreciate your time and your focus. This is so important for us to begin to embody the reciprocal relationship that our Dena'ina people, that all Native people have with their surroundings. And I am very honored to introduce you to Krishna Vena, uh, the place of my creation, the place of my ancestors, uh, what is now known as Lake Clark. So to introduce myself, um, again, my name is Ruth Chivaik Asen Miller. <clears throat> As I said before, I um, have had about an 11-year career in climate justice advocacy, um, but I often say that I've been doing this for generations, <laughs> for thousands and thousands of years, because while, you know, sure, it's, it's nice to be able to consider this work a job, it's really an, an ancestral imperative. It's a responsibility for Indigenous people. Um, we don't have the uh, luxury, I guess, but I also think it's a maybe a, a weakness. We don't have the curse of, of being dissociated with our homelands. And we know that the, the strength of our homelands is the strength of our people. Um, but as I um, has moved, have moved through my career in climate advocacy, I've also learned of the importance of making time for creation um, in my creative endeavors. And so I know that we might even be short on time now, but that's fine. I wanted to share with you just a few pieces that really speak to this work, uh, but have fed my spirit in the past few months since I've stepped back from um, direct advocacy, um, policy work, community, community education work. Um, and invested in my arts. And so I'm just going to share briefly um, three pieces and introduce some of the other aspects and dynamics of this work. Can I see in the chat if folks can see this? Great, I see one, yes, perfect. So this is um, one form of my artwork that I wanted to share today. This is a portrait. Um, this I actually did maybe Ooh, a long time ago <laughs> in 2015, or actually might have been a bit earlier than that. Um, 
And this is a portrait of the late elder Katie John. Um, and the reason why I particularly wanted to share this work today is because as we talk about conservation, as we talk about um, unburdening our homelands from colonial borders um, and management practices and regulations, we have to remember the long legacy of indigenous women, particularly our elders, who um, fought so hard to make uh, strides and progress in the movement that we um, are now benefiting from today. And in Alaska, Katie John was one such elder. Katie uh, was uh, an Atna elder uh, from Mentasta Village. She was one of the last generation to grow up at Batsal Nidus, the traditional um, seasonal village of, the, of um, the Atna people of her region. She was uh, the daughter of the last great chief. Um, she married very young, had 14 kids and four other foster children. Um, and yet in her old age, as a culture bearer, uh, when subsistence fishing was denied um, oh, at, at the Batsalnidis fishery, she became extremely activated and began to lead um, really pivotal landmark lawsuits against both the uh, state of Alaska and later the federal government advocating uh, for years uh, for the protection of subsistence rights and demanding that native people of the region be allowed to fish for salmon in their rivers. Um, and so the court cases which were argued by the Native American Rights Fund were um, were were pivotal cases and are still, of course, being challenged and debated today, but became known as the Katie John Trilogy. Um, later in life, she um, was given an honorary doctorate and, and many accolades, but what was always closest to her heart were her grandchildren. Um, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren are about my age now, and they live on with her legacy of advocacy, um, which was brave, steadfast, but always, always grounded in culture. So as we consider, you know, what it means to participate in uh, the decolonization of conservation, we have to acknowledge the matriarchs that um, when they were denied everything, gave, still gave all that they had. And so this next... There we go. This next piece I wanted to briefly share about is um, not quite as traditional. I'm a traditional beadwork artist. Um, and this piece I created actually when I was in my last year of university at Brown University, where Kai Bosworth was an assistant professor at the same time. So I don't know if Kai's still on, but I was really happy to see you sharing on this past panel. Um, and through this piece, I wanted to communicate the intersection of um, our experience as Native women and our the devastation of our salmon. And so you'll see looking first on the left side, um, the figure of a woman. Um, there are some elements that I really wanted to pull out in this piece. Um, and around this woman, these white lines that I wanted to um, talk about are actually fat. And I was thinking as I was far away on Wampanoagan, uh, Narragansett homelands, um, about my salmon, of course, and about how badly I wanted to be able to fish and taste our fish and how we rejoice when we see the healthy lines of fat in um, the body of a salmon, how we how we know that it's an indication of nourishment and nutrients and wealth. Yet at the same time, you know, now and in modern dominant colonial culture, fat in a woman's body is considered an embarrassment or a source of shame. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see some fish row. Um, all of these little red beads were reminding me of um, the the journeys of fertility uh, that both our fish and our women go through um, and thinking about the abundance of eggs and the new life that springs from them. Um, but mostly as I was thinking about um, what it means to value our salmon, of course, I was considering uh, the great many threats that our salmon are facing and how they're directly tied to threats on the bodies of our indigenous women. And so um, you'll see here on the right side of the image, um, the woman's body creates a silhouette that is missing, um, and in doing so forms the image of a salmon's mouth. Um, because we know that the same development projects, the same extractive projects that threaten um, our salmon runs also are direct threats to our Indigenous women's safety. We observe um, and have 
conclusively found disproportionate rates of missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, in proximity to extraction and development projects, particularly the man camps, um, that not only desecrate our environment, but uh, threaten the safety and well-being of all Indigenous women in the area. We also know that those same projects pollute the air, pollute the streams to the point where um, villages in the surrounding area of these development projects have record high rates of um, PFAS, of contaminants, of chemical leakage, of cancers, um, of fertility issues uh, because of their proximity to, to these toxic sites on their homelands. And so this speak this piece speaks to to what is missing when our women are taken from us in this way. And what you can't actually see in this picture is that that um, silhouette is a mirror. And so actually when when a person looks at this piece, they see themselves asking us to consider what each of our own engagement is in this battle. And the very last piece that I'd like to share briefly is this piece, which is um, a more recent one. It is titled Enda Ina Ya Bata Aina, which in my Den Ina language, which you all have heard quite a bit of today, um, means where have our loved ones gone? And this was first shown at a fashion show for a large convening called Arctic Encounters Symposium, which was held um, in Anchorage. This was in 2022. Um, it actually just happened again this year. And it is supposedly a convening that gathers um, Arctic decision makers, right? And so you have a lot of ambassadors, a lot of diplomats, a lot of state negotiators, um, but you also have a huge corporate presence. Two of their largest sponsors are Donlin Gold um, and Hillcorp and uh, as well as a number of other oil companies. Um, and so they do invite native leaders, but it is um, always, um, you know, despite many opportunities, a lot of feedback to change and improve, it has always been in quite disrespectful manners um, where youth and tribal leaders are not really given the platforms needed to be able to advocate effectively, to be included um, in expert panels. Usually they'll invite native people and then have them on a sideline panel talking about being native. So anyway, this piece. <laughs> uh, again titled where have our loved ones gone um i entered into their fashion show <laughs> um you will see um a lot of intersection between the history of colonization in alaska and the boarding schools particularly around the cutting of our hair which for my culture is our hair is very very sacred it is where we carry our memories um we only cut our hair in times of transformation um, for instance, at a coming of age or at the death of a loved one, um, you'll see my hair is short right now for the first time. Um, but what you can't quite see in this image is that the black fabric actually has um, a, an oil sheen over it. It is um, pretty iridescent. Um, and so I was speaking to the complicity and the direct culpability of the oil and gas industry in the destruction of our indigenous people's cultures and the murder and disappearance of our Indigenous women in this piece. Um, and because I think I'm already over time, I will end there and just say, Chinan Khali, thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to share with you. Thank you for joining me in that meditation. Again, it was originally created by Danielle Stickman, um, a Dan Ina sister of mine, and I am so, so looking forward to the next panel as well. Um, I see a good friend of mine, Wesley. Um, and Wes, you can probably talk to the Katie John Trilogy a lot more than I can, um, who's a, a staff attorney at Native American Rights Fund, a person who I deeply respect, as well as my auntie, Judith, Judith LeBlanc, um, who is just going to bring the fire every time, I'm sure. So Chinan Khali, thank you for letting me share. Ruth, thank you so much. I, um, I've i known you for many years, and this is the first time that I've seen your art, and it's just stunning, beautiful. You have so much talent and thank you for sharing that with us today. I'm going to turn things over to Judith LeBlanc now. She is a citizen of the Caddo Nation of Oklahoma. She is the executive director of Native Organizers Alliance. Uh, she's a friend of mine going back 20 years. Um, take it away, Judith, for defending the sacred in law and policy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Becca. I am really excited about the fact that for the last day and a half, you've been exploring, many of you have been exploring how to, 
how to return the sacred as into the hands and the minds and the hearts of the people, all people. Unfencing the future and the natural history, this event and the launch of the Red um, Natural History Project is, is a very important both political, social, and cultural project because it is a sign of the times. We, we know and we understand that for way too long, the narrative has been that native peoples are of the past, gone, part of history. But the truth is that in the last few years, especially we've interrupted that narrative. And one of those areas has been to awaken a broad cross section of people in this country as to who and how national packs were created, why and by who the entire landscape of sacred places have been threatened by fossil fuel industries, by climate change and reckless development. And so I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this panel. Uh, we uh, have worked with Becca and others uh, that have been a part of the past day and a half on a number of different initiatives. And I just wanna share that Native Organizers Alliance worked with uh, uh, the tribal leaders of over 49 tribes to convene the first ever gathering of tribal leaders who have ancestral relationships to the Yellowstone National Pack. It was on, to mark the anniversary, the 150th anniversary of the pack. Few people realize that Yellowstone was created with military action. Yes, an act of, of Congress, but military action, removing our peoples from that place that is now Yellowstone. And the irony is that hundreds of thousands of people go there to reconnect to the natural world, to renew their understanding of the natural world. And yet Yellowstone was created through a military action. And so we have begun work, uh, tribal leaders, native communities have begun work all over the country to restore nat national packs, to, to restore those entities to as recognized as sacred places to native peoples that have long, long histories beyond the establishment of the national packs. And there's quite a bit of uh, momentum around that. But today we're going to enjoy, I think, a chat around the virtual fire. Many, many amazing and beautiful things happen around fires. There's ceremony, there's singing, there are conversations about the past and the future. There's schmores, there are, there are, there are children who, who have grown up, our children, all children have grown up understanding that being around a fire is a is a, a special place. So I want to welcome the two uh, people who will be joining me around this virtual fire. Um, I'd like to say hello to President Whitney Gravel, President of the Bay Mills Indian Community. It's so good to see you, Whitney. And I, I want to say hello to Wesley um, Furlong, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, from the Native American Rights Fund. I'm, I'm interested in learning more about your experiences. Whitney and I have a, have a pass that's called the Red Road to DC Totem Journey. So she and I have, have been to a rodeo or two before together. So I thought it would be good if perhaps we could start this fireside chat uh, by each of you telling us a little bit about your relationship, your relationship to the struggles to protect sacred places. Wesley, Wesley. Yes, thank you. Um, I said to mute myself because uh, someone decided to ring the doorbell just as just as you were asking me to speak, and my dog uh, was barking at them. Um, yeah, so my name is Wesley Furlong. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. Um, 
And I just before before we go on, I just wanted to um, you know thank thank Ruth for her um, you know beautiful meditation and sharing her art. Um, I've known Ruth for six or seven years. Um, her her mom Heather Kendall Miller actually um, hired me um, right out of law school to to start at the Native American Rights Fund and was my mentor for a number of years. So um, it was great to see Ruth, um, and um, I'm really. Um, appreciative of her grounding us um, in this conversation. Um, but I, so I'm a senior staff attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. A lot of what I work on is um, representing um, Indian tribes um, in Alaska in the lower 48, um, as well as Native Hawaiian organizations in, in Hawaii um, in um, natural resource, in the natural resource and cultural resource um, context. Um, Often when federal agencies are making land management decisions or um, reviewing permits for um, infrastructure or natural resource development projects. And um, as part of that work, um, myself and other colleagues at the Native American Rights Fund, as well as at Earth Justice represent the Bay Mills Indian community um, in the ongoing environmental and cultural review of um, the uh, line five tunnel replacement project, um, proposed project um, in the Straits of Mackinac in Michigan. Um, so that's how that's how I know President Gravel. We've been working. I've, well, she's been working on it much longer than I have, but I've I joined our our team working on that um, a couple of years ago, and um, we've been working together on that um, uh, that project. So that's that's how we know each other. <laughs> so. As uh, Judith and, and Wesley said, my name is Whitney Gravel. My Anishinaabemowin name is the woman who stands in the north. And I come from the place of the Pike, also known as Bay Mills Indian community. And uh, as Wesley described, you know, right now we are, are currently and actively working to protect the Straits of Mackinac as well as other areas within the state of Michigan from uh, extractive uh, development projects related to the Line 5 dual pipelines. But Bay Mills Indian community and my family have had a really long history in protecting sacred rights and sacred places, mostly those associated with the use of treaty rights. Uh, the use of being able to go out and fish, hunt, and gather, and maintain that familial relationship with both land and water. And so it's something that my family and my tribal nation carries to the highest regard because we understand that we need those relationships in order to live out our Indigenous life ways. And so it's been um, a long journey, uh, and it continues, and it's likely something that we will have to continue uh, protecting and defending for the rest of time so that we can continue to be who we are as a people and, and live out our traditional and cultural life ways. So true, Whitney. And for some that might be disheartening, but from an indigenous perspective, that is our responsibility. That comes from relationship to the natural world. You know, Western science, they say, uh, they learn about trees. From an indigenous perspective, we learn from trees. We learn from the natural world. We recognize the patterns. We recognize the, the way that as two-legged, we must and do have a responsibility to the natural world. And so it's an ancestral responsibility. It's something that our descendants will do. So we, we know that there's a number of policies and laws uh, that have been created over the years to protect endangered ecosystems, to protect sacred and historic places. And uh, contrary, contrary to how history is sometimes told, all of those laws came about because of struggles, struggles between the people native people, conservationists, and oftentimes fossil fuel industries or reckless uh, uh, developers. So could you give us a little bit of a history as, as you see it at, of the 
lack of or the protections of sacred places and, and um, natural habitats? And um, what do you think needs to change? Either of you can jump right in. Wes, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, the, you know, we, there are a number of, there's a number of laws and, and policies at the federal level that we, that we work with um, seemingly on a, on a daily basis to protect, um, you know, natural ecosystems and sacred places and cultural places and, and, and cultural resources. Um, but they, uh, uh, unfortunately, are all very limited um, in their effectiveness. Um, and um, you know, the in, in the 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 summary of the of this of this panel in particular talks about the the National Environmental Pre um, Policy Act um, and the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, those are probably the two the two most important laws that um, are used for the. Um, protection um, or preservation of natural and cultural resources. Um, but unfortunately, both of those laws um, don't require um, the, the protection of any of the resources that they, they cover. Um, so the National Environmental Policy Act um, is called policy for a reason and not protection because it doesn't require that, that federal agencies protect any environmental um, resources. It, it simply requires that they um, what, what courts have come to say is take a hard look at the um, potential impacts that projects will have on the quote unquote human environment. Um, and the National Historic Preservation Act, despite having the word preservation in it, um, just like NEPA, uh, does also not require the preservation of historic resources that fall under its ambit. Um, just, like, just like NEPA, the NHPA, simply requires agencies um, to take into account the effects of, of um, their projects on historic resources. And these are really, um, they're really essentially planning tools and planning laws for the agencies um, to, um, in theory, understand the effects of the projects that they're undertaking or the projects that they're permitting um, and to essentially disclose them to the public. Um, and both of these, both of these laws in particular, are um, you know came came up came about. The National Historic Preservation Act came um, was enacted in 1966, and um, NEPA was enacted in 1970. And they were in response to really public outcry over certain things that had happened. Um, NEPA in particular um, came as a result of sort of the, the budding environmental and conservation movement in the 60s, and particularly in response to. Um, the repeated um, instances of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catching on fire. Um, and so it sort of became, came out of that. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, I think, I think certainly industry had um, a big Im impact on the law that was ultimately passed, which simply is process and is about understanding and disclosing impacts and, and making informed decisions, um, but not requiring them to do anything that would um, necessarily protect the environment. Um, and the National Historic Preservation Act, which was enacted in 1966, sort of comes out of that same context. Um, following World War II, there was a very large sort of industrial movement and um, particularly people um, back east we're seeing historic buildings getting bulldozed for large development. And they there was a reaction to that, which was we need to start considering and protecting these resources. And of course, the, oh, the, um, the law is written to simply um, consider those effects and um, disclose them, but not to actually protect those resources. Um, but you know, from from my perspective and our perspective, working with with um, with tribal nations, um, you know, these laws were not written to protect um, resources that that tribes um, care about and um, that are important to tribes. Um, you know, there, there's been amendments to particularly the National Historic Preservation Act in the nine, in the early 1990s that have included tribes and required agent the federal government to consult with tribes throughout their review. Um, but from in 1966 until 1992, that was not required. And the resources that really were considered important to be um, looked at 
in the section 106 process, which is this process to um, understand what these impacts are going to be, are real, was really focused on, you know, Euro-American, very Western type of historic resources, um, you know, historic buildings and um, um, urban districts, battlefields, you know, things like that. And um, the types of historic and culturally important resources that tribes often care about have not fit, do not fit easily within that. And so it's been a real it's been a real struggle over um, really since the 60s, but certainly since the early 1990s to get agencies to really um, change how they um, go about this and, and really um, work closely with tribes and, and, and um, take into account these effects on, on resources that, you know, from, from, for the most part, um, federal, federal um, officials don't really understand fully. Yeah, and I want to agree with Wes that, you know, not only did NEPA or the NHPA uh, not be written with Native cultural resources in mind or, or with our values of how we maintain those relationships, but even as it's been amended over the course of the years and even as tribal nations have begun to be included in the processes that exist within the law, the foundation of that law is still written with the Western ideology. And so when we are trying to advocate for protection of either burial mounds or sacred places, cultural resources, you have to go through a process of educating federal agencies on what even is a cultural resource. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? Because what each of us define it is, is going to vary drastically not only amongst the federal agencies, but also amongst tribes. And so that can also complicate the process even further when there are additional tribal nations that might be involved in a review of a certain area and really working together to make sure that the federal agency actually understands what the impacts are going to be to this resource. It's easy to protect a building because you want, you have the physical integrity of the building that you're keeping in mind. But when you're trying to uh, protect a landscape or a sacred place that's not as easily identified, and then you're talking about impl implications to harming a culture or uh, harming the ceremonial use of the place or harming the spirituality that is contained within those places, you start to get at the, at the core concepts of what it means to be an indigenous person and what it means to be a tribal nation. And as Wesley very eloquently stated, the law is not meant to preserve or protect that in any way. And so it ends up creating a lot of frustration for the tribes who are involved because you're simply trying to, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, protect your way of life and the tools that are given to you are inadequate. You know, it, it seems when looking over the last few years and some of the experiences uh, that tribes and native communities have had around the National Historic Preservation Act in NEPA, um, that there seems to be a Bermuda Triangle in the policies and implementation when it comes to sovereignty. That at, at the head of, in, in some ways, the, those laws and, and the different procedures that have been used or to, to move permits along for extractive industry uh, for example, that the idea of sovereignty is not really a working concept in those processes. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, primarily because um, sovereignty is already di diminished when you're asking tribal nations to participate in the process and then seek permission to protect those places. You know, if sovereignty was acknowledged or valued when we go through either the Section 106 process um, under the National Historic Pres Preservation Act or uh, under NEPA, then it would actually be the federal government coming to tribal nations and instead having a conversation about how do we, you know, uh, prevent harm to these places? How do we protect these places? How are we ensuring that your treaty rights are not impaired or that there's still a meaningful cultural connection uh, with the landscape? And um, just by 
requiring tribes to go through this process that will not end in any result that actually protects what they're fighting for, at the outset, it, it diminishes and, and does not involve tribal sovereignty in, in any way. Mm -hmm. Leslie, uh, would you give us a working definition of what sovereignty means in the 21st century? And then, then Whitney and I will pick it apart. Yes, please. Cool. <laughs> Please, this is this is the I think the the hardest question that you can ask anyone <laughs> anyone yes. uh, to define what sovereignty is um, in the twenty first century. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I, I I mean I think I mean it's it's many things, um, but I, I think a lot of it comes down to you know tri you know tribal nations being able to you know make their own decisions and decide you know decide you know, what their path is in this world and to be able to have the, the, the space to, to do that, um, you know, whether that's in protecting um, subsistence resources or cultural resources in the environment or providing, you know, for the, the, you know, whatever it may sort of be for like the health and welfare of, of tribal citizens and members, um, but being able to make those decisions about what's in the best interest for, you um, each tribal nation as a, as a nation as a whole, as well as, you know, on behalf of its, of its citizens um, and not having to, um, you know, seek permission uh, from the, from anyone else, you know, whether it's the federal government or, or states um, and, and be having that, that space to be able to, you know, make the decisions that are in the best interest of, of itself and, and its members without anyone or any other kind of government being able to step in or assert some sort of control over that. Um, it's not a very articulate definition, but um, um, I, I, would defer, I would defer to the, the elected tribal leader. I <laughs> think she might you have me too. some yeah, more thoughts I was just that. thinking, this is why Wes works for the Native American Rights Fund because he hit it spot on, you know, and it, it ultimately <laughs> is about um, being able to make decisions, uh, make decisions for the best interests of your people, um, for the best interests of uh, your nation, for the best interests of, um, you know, the relationships that we maintain. Um, I have a mentor that also said sovereignty is the right to make mistakes and to be forgiving with yourself when you make mistakes, because mm -hmm. we are human, we are not the creator and we can only rely on the teachings that we have received to guide ourselves in, in the best way possible. And, and in my culture, you know, live our, our Mino Babant is win our, our good life. And it's because of those teachings and, and wrapping them in, in our sovereignty, that's ultimately what, it, what it's all about. How can we guide ourselves in the best way possible? You know, when, when Native Organizers Alliance does leadership development trainings, we always like to explore this question because the way that we interpret treaties or we did in like 1870 is going to be very different in some ways as we interpret them now. It's just like cultural traditions and protocols and ceremony. We have passed it from generation to generation but it changes based on the conditions in which we are doing ceremony and, and is the same is with treaties. And we have done some trainings with uh, quite a number of non-native groups on sovereignty, because as a result of the leadership of tribal and native communities over the last 12, 13 years in the environmental protection arena, Many people recognize that, you know, we're nations within this nation. We have a special role to play because we have a legal standing to challenge federal policies in court. We're dual citizens, citizens of our nations and citizens of the United States. And I was recently uh, taught for a semester at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And this is the premier school on public policy of supposedly. Well, the Native students in the master's degree program at Harvard came to me. I was only the second Indian since 1966 to be a part of the 
Institute of Politics Resident Fellows Program. The first was Ada Deer. Ada Deer, Menominee, firebrand and, and amazing uh, leader of the fight to regain recognition for the Menominee tribe. Um, but the students in the, in the public policy two-year master's program came to me and said, not one case study on sovereignty or tribal nation, not one. So that means the people they are pumping out with these very prestigious degrees from Harvard who go into federal uh, government, who go into state or local government will have a total blind spot when it comes to jurisdiction and sovereignty. And that sovereignty is a constitutionally guaranteed right. Sovereignty is an inherent right, but it is a constitutional right. How do you think sovereignty or, or it's the lack of recognition of sovereignty has played out in the struggles around line five or, or the Willow Project or, or other uh, recent struggles uh, involving NEPA and, and uh, the National Historic Preservation Act? Um, one of the largest struggles as it relates to respecting or acknowledging a, a tribe's sovereignty in the process is the idea of consultation being embedded within the law because consultation can end at any time. And so what it doesn't actually guarantee is that uh, the outcome, the determinative outcome from the review actually take into consideration the issues that are raised by tribal nations when they're trying to protect these sacred places. And if you run into a, a disagreement because many of these laws are designed to lead towards uh, the permit application actually being granted rather than denied, is that the federal agency can then stop tribal consultation. And even though they've engaged in tribal consultation, do not necessarily have to take anything that was revealed in tribal consultation into consideration when they make their decision. And so by having a process that is devoid of a responsibility or an obligation towards what tribal consultation is actually meant to mean, which is, it, it's meant to mean an acknowledgement of that sovereignty, an acknowledgement of tribal nations participating in the decision-making process. But because it stands on such weak ground, what we actually end up finding is that it becomes a check the box exercise that takes up much of the tribal nation's resources and efforts and services. And it can lead to even more broken relationships between tribes and, and federal and state agencies. Yeah, I mean, you know, consultation, it, it, it often just is, I mean, it doesn't feel like it often is, you, you, we go, I mean, it's been virtual um, for the last few years, but even in person before that and coming back out of, out of the pandemic now, it often feels sort of like, a, it's often, it often is a one-way listening session. Um, where either the agency is coming is is coming to to talk to to consult with one tribe or many tribes, and it's it's them coming to present a bunch of information, and then say, "Give us your comments in 30 days," or it's we're just going to sit here and listen to what you have to say. We're not going to respond to any of it. We're going to take notes, and you know maybe maybe we'll get back to you. Maybe most likely we're probably not going to. Um, you know, it might, you know, the, the, you would think consultation and it's supposed to be, you know, the, a, a real back and forth, a dialogue where, where two different entities are coming together and, you know, hashing out differences or really engaging over the subject matter that they're consulting about. But uh, most, most often it, 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 it ends up being sort of a, a one way sort of listening session of either the agency presenting information and not wanting to talk or, um, the agency just simply listening um, and just sort of <laughs> giving a space for tribes to like vent their frustration, which certainly has a place, but you know, that's the ex often the extent of it, right? And so there is that doesn't lead to anything other than um, more frustration. Um, and, and I would, you know, also sort of, you know, underlie this with um, the fact that, you know, all that we really have is consultation necessarily it undermines tribal sovereignty. Um, and I, I know it's, I'm, I'm kind of seeing a lot of like the, the chat bubbles pop up. I saw someone mention um, 
the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and free prior and informed consent. Um, you know, we don't have consent in in the United States uh, as part of any federal law. So it's it's simply consultation. Um, and you know, the federal federal agencies do not have to get permission from tribes or get their consent or approval to do anything unless it's on you know tribal land. Um, but you know, tribal land today is is a, a very a very small small percentage of 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 where the federal government is exerting its authority to permit or to manage lands. Um, and so I think we're already sort of we're already operating from a place where sovereignty is necessarily diminished because tribes are not in a position to say no to projects or to tell agencies no they can't do this because the agencies don't have to ask that and so at the end of the day the agencies say well we you know we talked to them we sent them a couple letters and uh you know we marked we wrote in our you know our eis or in our administrative record that they had objections and we said oh well and we move forward and you know i think agencies that's the way agencies have operated um and that that's that way of operating has been um essentially sanctioned by courts um because uh, you know we, we there are very few judges on uh, you know anywhere but certainly in the federal bench who um came from a background um you know i mean i think there's maybe you know less than five native judges in the federal judiciary around the entire country um, and probably not very many more that have prior to becoming a judge you know worked in Indian country or worked with tribes um, so you know explaining to judges through the the, the you know the, the the American legal system what consultation is supposed to mean it you know is 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 really lost I think on courts too so agencies agencies practice is is always um, sub subpar and that is essentially signed off on by courts who don't understand it either um it's just sort of a a, a vicious cycle that, that, that they just sort of get this negative feedback loop of well this is all this is this is what we did a court doesn't understand it they says it's fine and then they just go well that court said it's fine so that's all we have to do um and most often it's it's just simply inadequate um even even if we accept the sort of, um, you know, accept that we're not going to be in a position of being able to dictate the outcome, even this sort of lesser position of simply um, have, being consulted with, um, that's not even going to be, you know, agencies aren't even going to meet that minimum, that that less than minimum standard. And so, oh, go ahead. Well, no, no. I just wanted to build on something, uh, Wes said to for our line five work specifically here in the state of Michigan. And for those of you who aren't familiar with line five, it is a, a dual oil pipeline that runs more than 600 miles through the state of Michigan and runs through Bay Mills Indian communities treaty ceded territory as well as through the Straits of Mackinac, um, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later um, in terms of the sacredness of that place. But as we've been engaging in several federal permit processes and state permit processes on this project, not only has consultation failed us, but the obligations of a, a federal agency and the federal trust responsibility has also failed us. Because oftentimes these projects are very complex and they often um, assume many risks, whether it be an oil spill on land or in water, or it may destroy a cultural site on land or in water. And as we bring up these issues or as we expend the energy to identify them for the federal agency, they are not willing to look beyond what the scope of their authority is. And so if you are identifying a valid and sincere concern regarding a project, whether it's under NEPA or NHPA, the federal agency, even if it's a, a valid concern, will not look at it unless it's within the scope of their authority, which for us doesn't make any sense. Because again, tying back to sovereignty, these are two sovereigns engaging each other. This is the United States through a federal agency engaging with our sovereign government, Bay Mills Indian community. 
and yet they are not willing to answer for other federal agencies. They are not willing to speak to other federal agencies about the concerns that are being raised. And in a way, it weakens the process as well, because despite asking tribes to relay their concerns, again, like, like Wes had identified, they're not willing to do anything about it if it's not mandated to them by law. And in some situations, the law may be open or gray or sometimes does not address the concerns specifically, but if it is not required of them, they are not willing to take an extra step to do what is right and to do the things that they need to do in order to protect those areas. You know, I, um, I mean, it's, for us, it's easy to understand why sovereignty is an important protection really for natural ecosystems, public lands, and our sacred places, and the health and well-being of Mother Earth. But I don't think a lot of people understand that. Um, and recently, what, uh, we were in a conversation with a, uh, a PAC superintendent of a national PAC, and he said, oh yes, you know, we, we had a discussion with two different tribes on the buffalo, herds in our pack. And one tribe took one position, another tribe took another position, and it was the same treaty. So like, what do we do? And I think that the dilemma that we face is, as Whitney has said, that being engaged in some of these processes diminish, diminishes our sovereign rights our sense of sovereignty. So what, what, what do you think is kind of the step that we need to take to, what are the steps we need to take to help other people understand that sovereignty is important for everyone, that sovereignty is a part of a multiracial democracy, the fulfillment of achieving a multiracial democracy. Why is sovereignty so important? not only for us, but for everybody else. They say if, you, if there's three seconds of silence, there's something very, very wrong. <laughs> no, it, it was just a really deep and, and powerful question, you know, because in order to, um, explain sovereignty or have them understand why why sovereignty is important uh, requires mutual respect. Because when you speak with federal agencies, they have no problem understanding their authorities. They have no problem exercising the powers of the United States, but they're not willing to extend the same courtesy to tribal nations. And if they could understand, you know, what we talked about in sovereignty being the right to make decisions, to carve your own path in life, to um, acknowledge your, your destiny in the way that the creator has designed it for your people. What they're really doing is allowing us that we're empowered by our sovereignty and no one wants to allow or acknowledge an empowerment if it diminishes theirs. And so really to have a mutual respect of, of sovereignty would, re, would then acknowledge the teachings that we have that we are all equal. And that is not what our systems are built on here in the United States. That's not really what they're built on um, in any type of Western um, ideology. It's built on a system of hierarchy. But really if we could return to those teachings that we are equal or sometimes that we are even less equal than the environment. You know, we, we have teachings in our Anishinaabe culture that in the line of creation, we were created last because we are the least important. And mm -hmm. if we could start to acknowledge that in, by having mutual respect of sovereignty, I truly believe that we would have a more harmonious relationship with the earth, with Turtle Island, and we wouldn't be suffering the impacts that we are today, whether it be from 
pollution or, or, or climate change or, or other contamination that we constantly have to fight against. Yes, yes, yes. Whitney, this is the medicine. This is why it is important that we're able and should and must be included in these big debates, in these policy decisions, but also in, in, in the narrative of who this country should be. Because you know what? We have medicine that we are bringing from the past and, and we are projecting into the future what it will take for all of us, not just natives, not just tribal communities to live in a good way. It, it's so important what you said. Were you going to say something, Leslie? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, I think, I think a lot of it is, is, um, is, is, you know, a lack of education in this country about I mean, very fundamentally what tribes are, um, and, and potentially even more fundamentally that there are still tribes and indigenous people in this country. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many people that have no have no clue that, I mean, that, you know, they, they're, they're only, you know, exposure in school to, to tribes and, and native people is sort of like the, the, the brief history of, of the, 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 you know, manifest destiny and the, the colonization of, of the West. And there's no recognition or understanding or learning that, um, you know, there's 574 federally recognized tribes in this country that, that exist today that are all sovereign governments that have citizens that provide for their their members um, and in and in many cases are you know employers and contributors to their you know the, these local economy but, but you know that we're not talking like that there's just sort of a, i think a, a lack of 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 education around you know knowing that tribes are 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 here uh, that they're they're you know they're 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 everywhere and that they're not this sort of like something of the past that 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 no longer exists today um you know i think in in some parts of the country you know where i grew up in outside seattle um you know i think there's certainly a, a an understanding and a recognition that tribes are uh, you know ex exist and and occupy the space and you know we we drive through you know around seattle and where i grew up and you know you drive through reservations and you see the the casinos and the gaming operations and and the the impact that tribes have in you know day-to-day -day life of of everyone in in that area um but many places um you know where there's been a, a history of of um of removal um of termination of genocide um in a way that in a, in a way that's um you know different than maybe like the pacific northwest for example um where, where there aren't there are now not tribes i think there's lots of people that don't recognize that don't understand that tribes are still here and are are doing lots of you know, very important things for not just their own citizens, but for everyone around them. Um, and, and um, you know, I don't know, I don't know the answer and how to like educate people about that. But I think, I think education is a really important part. And, you know, it's like the federal, the federal government and federal officials have a unique obligation to need to know, to need to understand this. They have to, to be able to do their job, to fulfill their their trust relationship with tribes. But um, I think beyond that, you know, people just generally in the country, I think there needs to be an obligation to recognize that there are these sovereign nations that that exist today and that there are, you know, they have thousands and, and millions of, of members across this country who mm -hmm. um, are alive today and, and exist. And it's not just something of the past. You know, it's from the inauguration day on when the Biden administration came into office. In his speech, he repeatedly said states, local governments, and tribal nations. It was the first time that I ever heard a president say that at an event like that. And I think we've seen some headway in and in the sense of recognition that states and counties and tribal nations are separate entities that need to be considered in federal policy. And um, I think we have a long way to go because uh, 
in in some ways sovereignty is like being pregnant you know you're not a little bit pregnant you're either pregnant or you're not you're either sovereign or you're not and for a lot of our leaders and i include native community leaders in urban areas since so many of us indians like myself who walk with a high heel on one foot and a moccasin on the other urban indians sovereignty is very significant for us as well um, because sovereignty is about recognizing the nations and the commitments of the federal government so white people have a, a stake in sovereignty because their ancestors signed that treaty that was that is guaranteed by the constitution i would also add that sovereignty is is a recognition of federal responsibilities to to, to sovereign nations within this nation and it is it is also about achieving treaty rights across the board so for example many treaties health care a doctor on each reservation was guaranteed well let's interpret it for in the 21st century health care is a treaty right we have the right to have, we gave up land we negotiated we we died around the, these treaty signings. And we have a treaty right to healthcare, quality healthcare. Actually, that's a human right. So when we say sovereignty is good for, for native nations, but it's even just as important for non-native communities, what we're saying is that if we, if we are leaning into our sovereign rights as the Standing Rock Sioux tribe did around the Dakota Access Pipeline, they were not just fighting for the drinking water of 10,000 members of their tribe. They were fighting on behalf of 17 million people who live downstream from them, who live, love, work, play along the shores of the Missouri. And so many of these struggles, the KXL Pipeline, Line 5, the struggles to protect the salmon, they are not it is not for us, it is for humanity, it's for the community, it's for the broader circles of people who are touched by these vital issues. So I, I, I would have to say that many of our leaders need to understand that we're speaking for the majority. We're not a special interest group. Sovereignty doesn't make us like a special interest group. Our sovereignty is a, can be a strength in protecting Mother Earth and dealing with problems like access to healthcare. Because as we speak, we're speaking for the majority. We're not a special interest group. So we've talked a, a lot about some of the, the problems with the federal laws and policies and their implementations and the Bermuda Triangle that exists um, when it comes to understanding it and actually utilizing sovereignty. Um, what do you think needs to be done? What can be fixed about the laws and policies? What 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 is pointing towards real solutions in the near, it, more in the present? And how do we get to that horizon when we do achieve uh, a government that is more deeply democratic and therefore recognizes the importance of their role in protecting sacred places, public lands, and, and the natural world? What, what do we need to do now to get to that horizon? What kinds of changes need to happen we need policy and law and regulation that is proactive instead of reactive that is the number one problem with the law and, and policy that is implemented today is that a problem occurs and then we respond to fix it um you know very uh, recently in in ohio we had the, the uh uh, rail derailment that happened and poisoned much of the watershed there, there were signs and reports and exhibits that, that showed that type of imminent disaster would happen, but nothing was done about it until it happened. And we have many of the teachings within our cultures that require us to look that seven generations ahead. And if we could start implementing that practice to not just think about how can I resolve the concerns for myself or for my people today, but for the future 
seven generations down the road and make sure that the policy or the law or the regulation is well-rounded enough, thought out well enough, that it will take all of those things into consideration and we will end up in a better world because of it. That is what we need to start doing. We are so reactive to alleviating the current problems of today that we don't plan for the future problems of tomorrow. And all of that can be seen in the environmental issues that we deal with today. We did not think of the consequences of our actions when we built pipelines or when we engaged in extractive industries or when we refused to make the technological advances to prevent that type of harm to Turtle Island. And now we're in, in a policy state of where we're reacting to the consequences of our prior decisions. But even now, when we engage in, in that legislation or, or that policy, we're still reacting. So when are we going to start being proactive? And one thing I, I always attribute towards our indigenous relatives is that in looking those seven generations into the future, we are willing to bear the hardships that are needed to ensure that those seven generations ahead live a better life. And if that comes out of our love for one another, out of our care for one another, because we grew up in these types of communities where we know that we rely on one another to be able to carry out our ways of life. And so if we could do that collectively as a society and not just try to ease our individual burdens, but ease the burdens of the future, I think we would be in a much better place when it comes to changing law or, or um, being proactive enough to think of not just how we can change NHPA or NEPA, you know, to solve the problems that are occurring, but how will we solve them seven generations into the future as well? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think that proactive, not reactive. You know, the Navajo have a, a phrase that talks about walking in beauty, walking in balance, where you are neither leaning forward or leaning back, but you're walking with a 365 degree awareness, walking in the spiritual sense, walking in, in, in the sense of your mind and your and your heart. And I sometimes I think about how I think an indigenous framework is medicine for the crisis. So when you look at the reaction to those kinds of men, human made disasters like that train wreck or natural disasters like hurricanes or tornadoes, the reactive element means that there are a lot of mistakes that you're responding to a crisis without thinking looking at the horizon and an indigenous framework actually requires in order to be in balance that you're looking at the horizon and you're looking at the present, you understand from where we came and therefore, where do we go? How do we, we walk right in the present? I, and, you know, it brings me to, to, I think, to thinking about the impact of representation and the fact that Native peoples need to be judges. We need to be, you know, in elected positions. We need to be visible in the cultural arena. And, we, and, and really, uh, the way that the grassroots mobilized in 2020 and showed our Native political power on the ground, we were able to actually do something historic that I never thought I would live to see the day that there would be a Native woman heading up the Department of Interior. Representation matters because then we're more in a position of, of, of dealing as, as a part of governing for the whole, using our Indigenous framework and life experience and belief systems to engage in political, economic, and social uh, uh, processes. What do you think has, what do you think the direction, where, where are we going? What, what are the next big hurdles that we have to face? And I think 
you know, there's two years left in this administration. They have done some very important things. They also fall into some of the pressures of the fossil fuel industry. Um, and they're, they're doing, they're, they're trying to balance the pressures from the grassroots and tribal nations and native communities around climate change and the fact that majority of people want some action on climate change. And at the same time, the oil companies, they have a lot of power. They have, a, they have more power than we do right now, even though the majority opinion is, is to do something around, about the climate crisis that we're experiencing. What do you think are some of the next steps that we should take? What, what a, what's the call to action? I mean, I, I, think, I think tribal nations are, are in a really unique position to push the, the needle on a lot of this. Um, you know, they're, 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 there's, there's, um, there are governments that exist outside the, the structure of the US constitution that have their own inherent sovereignty. And you, you know, each, each one of the 574 tribal governments is unique. And they're all unique compared to the federal government and their state governments and our local governments. And I think that there, um, I think there's a lot, there, I think there's plenty of examples that you know our state and federal governments can look to within tribal nations on how better to govern, govern more effectively, govern more holistically, govern govern in a way that you know, actually fulfills the needs of of uh, you know citizens of the state or the the gov or the the country more broadly. Um, but I also think tribes are uniquely positioned to push. Uh, utilize their sovereignty and their their unique legal rights that no one else has in this country to push um, the needle on these things, particularly climate change tribes, you know, in particular that have treaty rights, um, um, you know, particularly treaty rights uh, to fish and hunt, and I think particularly treaty rights to fish uh, that's so uh, so dramatically impacted by climate change through. Um, you know, the, the warming of waters and, and, you know, before I grew up, you know, like the, in the Pacific Northwest, like the, the rising of temperatures in spawning grounds for salmon, um, you know, tribes have, uh, many tribes have these unique, very powerful legal tools to, um, that I think can be utilized to really push the, the needle on a lot of these things, because ultimately these treaties are the supreme law of the land and the federal government is, in theory, legally obligated to uphold these treaties and to ensure that their, um, you know, their their provisions are fully met and their obligations are met. And so I think I think there is a, you know, I don't I don't I don't want to say that the the burden needs to fall on Indian country to have to lead all of this and to to take the and to you know have the 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 full weight of having to save everyone. But I do think that tribes are in a unique position to really push the needle on this because they have you know their they have unique legal, they're a unique legal status that, you know, and their, their inherent sovereignty means that they can really, they can really push this in a way that states may not be able to, or the federal government might not be able to or willing to. Um, and I think there's, you know, examples of, I think that the uh, state and local and federal governments can look to tribes as examples on how to, and how to do these things. And I, I just would also just wanted to, to um, you know, you mentioned representation, um, you know, with, with Secretary Holland leading the Department of the Interior. Um, I think that's also really important, seeing, seeing more, more Native people in these positions of power and not just within positions that we would sort of just naturally think, oh, well, Department of Interior, they, they you know, that's Indian Affairs. So, of course, that makes sense to have... Um, you know, a native woman running interior, but, you know, in, in spaces outside that, because it's, you know, Indian affairs isn't the only thing that is important to tribes. And, you know, um, there's other parts of the government that there, all parts of the government should have native leadership in. And one of the, I think one of the unique ones that I think that President Gravel and I have maybe have seen some, um, some positive change in is like the, the leadership of the Army Corps of Engineers is the, the two political appointees who oversee the Army Corps are tribal members. Um, that's the first time ever that any that any tribal member has overseen the Army Corps. And we, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say the Army Corps is doing a great job and that everything has just completely changed and it's all better, but we have seen more movement 
um, in more positive steps out of the Army Corps in the last two years than in its entire history. And I think that can be attributed solely to native leadership um, and saying this is that we're here and this has been our experience with this agency and we're going to make changes. And so I think it's I think it's very I think that sort of representation is very important as well as, you know, every day everyday um, representation when it comes to voting and redistricting and those sorts of things as well and exercising, um, you know, individuals exercising those those powers that they have and, and fighting for more fair fair and open elections and, and representation uh, at, at that very grassroots level as well. For me, I really see on the landscape that there's going to be a new treaty recognition era. You know, when you look back to the 70s, it was mostly about the acknowledgement of those rights and acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty and regulating those rights and acknowledgement of uh, sovereignty in the sense that the United States negotiated these treaties with sovereigns. And what we're going to start to see is that new recognition of really what has always been the wisdom of our ancestors. And I give thanks to the ancestors that negotiated our treaty every single day because I know they faced insurmountable pressure in those negotiations to concede and to give up and to back down. And yet within that treaty, they were able to carve out one of the most precious things that they could, which boils down to us being able to live our indigenous life ways. In the treaty, it's called the usual privileges of occupancy. It's been called the treaty right to fish, the, the treaty right to hunt, the treaty right to gather, but really it's a treaty right of relationships, a, a relationship amongst our people, a relationship with the land, a relationship with the water. And as we move forward, you know, dealing with the consequences of our prior actions, we are going to start to see a new treaty area where those treaties are used now to protect and to preserve and to defend, which is where we fail in federal law. And I say that because treaties are a mutual exchange. They're a forever exchange. You have the treaty rights in exchange for the land. And if the land is not going to give, be given back, the treaty right must be preserved. And you can't have the treaty right to fish without water without clean water. You can't have a treaty right to fish without access to the land to fish and to reach the water. And you cannot have a healthy water system, an ecosystem, have the fish, have, have all of the animals, have all of the water, unless you are protecting and preserving the environment. And so we will enter a new treaty era and we will enter a new sovereignty era by which tribes are stepping up to the mantle and finally protecting what our ancestors did centuries ago, which was to be able to maintain those relationships so that we could be who we are. Because my people cannot leave the state of Michigan if it is destroyed. This is our ancestral homeland. This is how we understand who we are as a people. This is how we understand our relationship with the creator. This is how we understand how we're supposed to take care of one another. And so it will always be our goal to be able to protect our home, protect those relationships. And then ultimately, as you said too, Judith, in protecting all of that, we're really protecting everyone because yeah. all we want in living our indigenous life ways is to maintain that harmonious relationship with land. We can live in a harmonious way. It does not need to be destruction. It does not need to lead uh, to catastrophe. There is a way and indigenous people have been doing it all along. Thank you so much. This has really been fantastic to be able to just chew the fat with you. I, you know, the Native American Rights Fund, uh, Native Organizers Alliance enjoys a very close working relationship uh, on an array of issues um, and the invaluable leadership of John Echo Hawk, another Oklahoma Indian. For generations, he has, he has been someone that has shaped um, many of the victories that we've won in the legal arena. So Wesley, good on you for being there working with John and, and Whitney, you, your leadership in Indian country is so important. And uh, Wesley, you were talking about how natives 
have led the way on a number of issues. Well, the Bay Mills Indian community, they provided COVID protection for the entire region, not just for their tribal members. They, they understood their role and, and Bay Mills Indian community and so many others uh, have, have been able to contribute in dire situations to the welfare of all people. And Whitney, your leadership in Indian country is just uh, so important. So mm -hmm. it's been a pleasure. We have to light this fire again sometime in another place. But before we end, you have to, you have to show where you're really coming from, what your, your belief system is, which is better. Yellowstone or Reservation Dogs? Which TV show is the best? You stop first, Wesley. Oh, I'll, I'll just say I uh, I haven't seen a single single second of Yellowstone, um, so I'm definitely a uh, um, hundred percent Res Dogs. Whitney, you I haven't seen Yellowstone. I thought you were talking about the park at first until you said <laughs> Reservation <laughs> Dogs. So I want to be the next auntie that goes to the IHS conference. So. That's where I'm okay. At. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Judith, Whitney, and Wesley. I confess I also thought you were talking about the park. I'm like, how do you compare a park and a TV show? <laughs> Um, thank you, Judith. That was such an important conversation. And thank you to all of you for um, sticking around. And, and uh, the chat was so active. I'm glad you're engaging with this content. We are going to, at the end of the symposium, um, send around uh, links and calls to action so that you can um, uh, support this kind of work. Um, so now we have a uh, creative interlude um, we're going to show a short film by the Natural History Museum um, called From the Ancestors to the Grandchildren. It's narrated by Freddie Lane from the Lummi Nation, uh, and it introduces the ways of seeing, understanding, and relating to land, water, air um, that guides the work of the House of Tears Carvers. Uh, a collective of carvers from the Lummi Nation. Um, the video was in an exhibition that we developed with the House of Tears about their totem pole journeys at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Um, after that, you're gonna hear a track from Leanne uh, Betasanasaki Simpson's critically acclaimed album, Theory of Ice. Um, and then finally, Steve Lyons, research director for the Natural History Museum is gonna pop on um, to weave together some of the threads that have been laid out over the last two days. We've covered a lot of ground and we're about to, we're in the, the home stretch. We're about to have our, our final um, session after this creative interlude. Um, so he'll kind of recap uh, where we're at and, and set up that final session. Without further ado, uh, here's the video. The totem pole journey doesn't draw a new line as much as it traces over one that already exists, making it visible. This line runs through the rocks, through the trees, through the sky, through the oceans. The burial grounds of the ancestors weren't only on the land, their bodies were also pushed out to sea. This is why it's not just the land that is sacred, it is also the water. Lessons were taught centuries ago that have been passed down for generations, lessons that guide us as stewards of the earth. The ancestors, in this way, speak through us to ensure the health of future generations. So it's also a line that runs from past to present and into the future. Today we face a great challenge. There's a prophecy that tells of a day when the rivers and skies turn black, the fish and the animals die. But it also speaks of a time when people will stand together to stop this from happening. What's happening in the world today is the result of a perspective that sees everything as a resource to be exploited. 
It's killing Mother Earth. It threatens life on the planet. People and animals are suffering. They're dying of cancers resulting from the air and the water being poisoned. But they're also fighting back. The Totem Pole Journey is a project that makes visible the struggle for life. It brings awareness to the connectedness of the people to the Earth and to history. It ties together communities who are living on the front line of the environmental emergency. It makes the commonality of their suffering visible and strengthens the bonds of solidarity between them. As the totem pole travels from place to place and comes into contact with more and more people, it grows more powerful. People who touch it give it power and it gives power to them. The journey also spreads the story of the prophecy and in doing so, it draws a line in the sand. The road that leads to death is not an option. The world is not made up of dead objects, resources to be burned. At this point in history, we are summoning all the forces of life that run through everything to come together in the common collective fight. From the ancestors to our grandchildren, Kwahoi, we draw the line. Welcome back, um, everyone. Uh, I'm sure for some of you, it's been a long two days. Um, and for others who are just joining us, welcome to Unfence the Future, Taking Down Fortress Conservation and Its Enduring Legacy. Uh, my name is Steve Lyons. I'm the Research Director at the Natural History Museum. Uh, and I was part of the team that put together this conference uh, that I, I couldn't be more excited about. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes before the, the beginning of the last uh, session just drawing a few threads uh, uh, in terms of what we've learned so far um, and, uh, and to kind of set us up for this last session that's going to broaden the frame, we hope. So over the past uh, two days, we've unpacked some of the key struggles that are playing out on the terrain of conservation in the United States both at the discipline's emergence in the 19th century and in the present day. We've seen that what we're calling fortress conservation has a long history and that the conservationist model engineered with the founding of the national parks was part of a broad project of settler colonial dispossession. And we've also learned that from the beginning, its history was interwoven with histories of resource extraction, militarism, and the violent displacement of indigenous peoples from their ancestral homelands. And with leaders from native movement, Pueblo, Pueblo Action Alliance and Apache Stronghold, we've learned that these histories are ongoing. Today's struggles to protect sacred places are not new. They come out of decades and even centuries of struggle between on the one side, the government and its corporate allies who have been working together to extract maximum value from the land. And on the other, the indigenous nations who refuse to give up their lands and, and as importantly, their cultural and spiritual relationships to the land. Across this two day conversation, we've hoped it's become, we hope it's become clear that fortress conservation is not just a failed conservationist approach. 
yielding worse outcomes than indigenous traditions of land stewardship and care. But it's also an expression of a logic that pervades in settler colonies and capitalist nation states, where fences, to take the metaphor we're uh, spinning around with this uh, conference, to, where fences are taken as a catch-all solution to social, environmental, and economic problems. In the capitalist world, fences partition the world, reinforcing imaginary borders between properties, between nations, and between conservation lands and industrial developments. Fences are also technologies for containment, for incarcerating some for the benefit of others, for keeping migrants out of the country, and at various points in US history, for containing Native Americans on reservation lands. When we see fortress conservation within this broad project of establishing and reinforcing extractive relations to the land, we can see how fortress conservation was never simply a flawed but well-intentioned approach to wildlife preservation. Rather, as a project of fortifying vulnerable habitats, sensitive ecosystems, and sublime natural landscapes against the harmful impacts of extraction and industrial development, fortress conservation is a mode of preservation that is precisely premised on the inevitable sacrifice of the world beyond. In our last panel, we, we will see that if the science of fortress conservation has been widely discredited, its legacy lives on in a wide range of responses to the climate crisis. From the militarization of national borders to the unrestrained siphoning of scarce water reserves, all of this, of course, underpinned by the same denial of indigenous consent and tribal sovereignty that the earliest experiments in fortress conservation were founded on. So if unfence the future is a call to action, what does this action imply? What might we describe and struggle toward? And how might we uh, struggle toward a future in which the protection of some does not require the sacrifice of others? What solidarities need to come into being and what solidarities already exist? And finally, where can we see the outlines of an unfenced future today in the land-based practices and community-led struggles of indigenous and other frontline environmental justice communities within and beyond the territorial boundaries of the settler colonial nation state? So without further ado, I'll send it over to Billy Fleming, one of our inaugural Red Natural History Fellows, who directs the McCarg Center at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania, who will be your moderator for this last session. So thank you all for joining and welcome, Billy. Thanks so much, Steve. It, it's been such a pleasure to, to get to catch snippets of this throughout um, the last couple of days, and I'm really looking forward to being able to dig in on all the material um, once it shows up online. And it's also such an honor to be able to be here um, to moderate this last panel of really incredible uh, leaders and organizers and other folks who I feel really lucky to be able to spend some time with, and I'm sure you will too. So I'm just going to say a few words by way of kind of framing and, and orientation um, to the panel, um, just to really emphasize a few points Steve um, sort of foregrounded for us. And then I'm going to turn things over to our panelists, and, and they sort of know um, we're not going to do the usual introductions. Um, most of them, if not all of them, I'm sure you all know of quite well, um, so don't need me to read things you can you've either already heard or can find out about them at your own sort of leisure. Um, what I'm going to ask them to do is to, to sort of help bring us into their work through um, a sort of introductory question to talk about some of the things they're doing now um, as a way and their values and commitments as a way to sort of bring them into this conversation uh, in a, a slightly different kind of way. So just to give you a bit more framing, this is this is all language you, you probably saw in the sort of lead up to the event. But um, you know, as Steve mentioned, while the sort of science of fortress conservation has been debunked and its ideology continues to sort of persist out in the world, um, you know, this panel is really sort of asking some critical questions at a, at a conceptual and op an operational and practical level about what it might mean to think about land-based practices within the context of the climate crisis differently. Some of those might be large sort of forested and natural landscapes um, that maybe perhaps immediately come to mind for some of you. Uh, some of those might also be related to the archipelago of sites of extraction and waste disposal um, and of, you know, material production and technology and shipping and logistics that are bound up in the energy transition and all of which are incredibly land intensive practices that will be inextricable from any conversation about land conservation uh, in the future. So 
With that, I'm going to ask each of our panelists. Yeah, you're already doing it. Great. Go ahead and come on on screen for me. Um, and I'm going to get us started here just by throwing a sort of, um, you know, relatively open ended prompt to you all. And Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to go first um, so you can start to get like wheels turning for us. But um, I, I think like a great uh, one way for us to really kind of begin this conversation is to have you all expand a bit more on, you know, the things people might already know about you and about your work. Tell us a bit more about sort of what and how and why you were brought into the kind of work that you do um, and help us bring us into some of this this conversation about unfencing the future um, through the values and commitments that you've demonstrated over the course of your careers in a variety of different places and the kind of work that you've, you've taken on. So, um, you know, a question here could look something like, how do you develop and build or maintain your relationships with some of the movements who are, you know, integral to the work that you're supporting and doing around the world? Um, how do you think about your commitments to those particular places or people, and how do you hold yourself accountable to them within this context of land-based practices and, and unfencing con conservation? Um, and how do you push towards some of the work that you're doing, knowing that it'll likely it'll likely persist long after um, you've decided to step away from it uh, or step away from this this planet? So, uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to get started, and then I'm going to go around here next to Dina and to Ruben, um, just so you all kind of get a sense of the order here. So, take it away, Elizabeth. Well, Ashe, and thank you so much for having me. It's a, an honor to be in community with all of you today. And that's a lot of questions, uh, but I'll do the best that I can. Um, well, I'll start with why I do this work. I am a descendant of colonialism, of extraction, of enslavement. And uh, my grandmother, uh, an indigenous woman, went to live in a place called El Fanguito in, in, in Puerto Rico, where she lost half of her children to hunger and disease. And so I come from struggle. And uh, I was born and raised in EJ communities and a lot of the problems, the health problems that uh, manifest as a result of toxic exposure live uh, in my lungs, in my body, and in the, the body of our, of our families. I co-chair the Climate Justice Alliance, which is a national organization made up of frontline leaders across the country, including uh, different movement formations. And we believe that the climate justice movement is the response of the front line of the climate crisis and that we operate at the intersection of racial and social rights and environmental and economic justice. And we focus on causes of, of the root causes of climate change. And what we do is we call for a transformation to a just, sustainable, community-led economy. Uh, literally, we are fighting at the intersection of racial justice and um, and climate change, and it's different depending on where you are in the United States. I'm in Brooklyn, in Lenape territory, um, and so with us having access to land, it's really challenging because we don't have site control, we don't own the property, and so we have to be really creative about how we engage in a green reindustrialization, how we uh, claim how we basically contrib uh, contribute to decarbonizing our community and investing in renewable energy, drinkable water, um, food sovereignty, wellness, and make sure that there's community wealth. And we do that through a variety of ways. Um, the other thing that it's important is that when we think about climate change, that often people are thinking and talking about the impact of this violence on us as a result of this history of extraction, uh, from the fossil fuel companies with the complicity of government without thinking about um, white supremacy and patriarchy and capitalism. And we can't have a conversation without those things uh, because for us, we are talking about communities that have had to deal with a legacy of extreme policing, of mass incarceration, of underemployment, poor educational opportunities, displacement, daily overt, overt, overt racism, a lack of healthy food and transit options. And on top of that, then you have to layer uh, the impact of extreme weather events that are, that are impacting our communities more than any other. So we have to look at the complexity of all of those and we have to look at it holistically and we have to center racial justice and equity uh, as we address climate change. And there are lots of threats and they're not just coming from governance. They're not coming from, uh, they're not just coming from um, uh, the fossil fuel companies. They're coming from neoliberals. They're coming from people who should be deeply aligned with us and are not. Um, just today, it's 87 degrees and it's April. And a few weeks ago, that's it. That's in Brooklyn. And just a few weeks ago, uh, there were 31 tornadoes within 24 hours uh, across nine states. So we are in it 
And so this moment really call, calls for deep solidarity. Uh, and we are not going to win unless we address issues that have to do with the legacy uh, of racial injustice in this country. So I'll just pass. Thanks. I guess that's my cue. <laughs> Thanks. Good to see you, Elizabeth and Ruben and Billy and everybody. Uh, YP Snuck Seal, E Squeeze, Dina Jillia Whitaker. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes, the Okanagan Band. And, uh, but I was raised in Los Angeles. So I, I uh, am a, consider myself an urban Indian. Uh, I'm also an educator and I teach American Indian studies at uh, California State University, San Marcos in Southern California. And so, uh, so the work that I do as an educator, as a researcher uh, and a writer is, and a journalist as well, is all very uh, place-based. That's how I was trained. Uh, and that's where my my loyal my my accountabilities lie. Like so, my accountability is not just to my tribal community, which is in Washington State, a place I've never lived, um, but uh, my accountabilities are also to the communities that I physically inhabit. So um, th these kind of constellations of of communities that we all uh, find ourselves in, in in various levels, and so. Uh, I uh, came to this conversation about environmental justice as a professor, as a as a grad student, really, as, when I was an undergrad. So when I was a student, so many years as an as a uh, activist, street activist before I went to school, and now I'm. I don't know why my thing is beeping like that. I'm going to try to turn it off, but I don't know if I can. But anyway. Um, I, so, so it, it's a long, long story. Uh, all of the research as a student that I had done around environmental justice resulted in a book called As Long as Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. And um, that's a, a book that's came out four years ago. It's been like pretty, pretty popular. Uh, people are still reading it, and uh, and it's it's really shaped the work that I continue to do uh, as an educator and as uh, as an activist. Um, but uh, I come to this project to the Red Natural History as one of the inaugural fellows, and uh, what we did was we participated in this cohort uh, in this fellowship. We wrote essays and. Uh, they were essays of, you know, a topic of our choice. And so, uh, and it resulted, in, it, accumulate, it accumulated into a dossier and the dossier can now be found online. And, uh, and so the essay that I wrote was, this is this wild uh, thing, a, a, a future, kind of a speculative fiction, speculative nonfiction, I don't even know what to call it, just something that I'd been thinking about for years, uh, knowing what I know about, about uh, colonialism, about federal Indian law, about policy, and having worked in the policy space for years um, as a research uh, researcher and writer. Um, so I, I just kind of put it all together in this essay called uh, A Possible Decolonized Future. So thinking about what decolonization, like what's the best possible outcome? How can, it, how can we get from, from here to there in the future that, that we can call a decolonized future? And uh, the... You know, this is something I think about a lot. I teach a course on decolonization, uh, an undergrad, an upper division undergrad course uh, to students who, who most of them have never even taken a, an, or a, uh, an American Indian studies course. So uh, it's really interesting to see how they engage with this topic. And it's very, uh, they're very engaged and it's very, I've taught the class twice and I'm really just blown away by how, how they get it and how they, once they're taught about this foundation, this thing that we call settler colonialism and understand that it 
that uh, it's a framework that structures the United States. And uh, uh, once they get it, once it's laid out for them, they can see it because it's it's kind of like, you know, once you see something, you can't see it. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. And so that's what I, uh, that's that's my approach with these students. And um, this, this essay that I wrote, it looks at this is fantasy piece that looks at a hundred years into the future and how the United States and its states and its relationship to and uh, talks about how uh, there's this paradigm shift that that's occurred in American society, and um, this is this is what. I, I'm always talking about with my students, with the, the people that I work with as on a consulting basis and all these different spaces that I uh, find myself in is talking about how do we create paradigm shift it, to a world that works for everybody, not just a privileged few or even a privileged majority. Uh, and so, uh, so I imagine a future where there's been a... Uh, a shift that happens through education. And we we have a thing called the Red Natural History Curriculum. And it's a it's a curriculum that uh, that teaches about indigenous knowledge, about indigenous relationships to place, about environmental and ecosystem based uh, land land practices and and sovereignty and policy and all of and all of that, and it gets infused into the to the education system everywhere at all levels. And it's this education, this curriculum process that infiltrates young people. And it's, it's through this education that uh, that we can actually get to policy change and uh, and actual. Uh, meaningful political relationships between tribes and the United States in the future. So, so it tackles education. It starts with education, the education of the young at a very systematic and structural level so that, uh, so that we can get to this place that is a workable future for everybody, especially the environment. And so we we create policy uh, that that is responsive to climate change, that uh, is responsive to all communities, all, all marginalized and dominant communities everywhere. And so um, and and so it and in terms of policy, it imagines uh, the the tr transformation of the trust responsibility. Uh, between tribes in the United States, so it it jettisons the do doctrine of discovery, it uh, it jettisons the trust responsibility, it jettisons this this uh, dynamic of uh, domestic dependent nations that the legal system is framed on, um, and looks at a uh, an international model of autonomy arrangements that we can find. Uh, in different countries in order to get to a more uh, stable and a more honest and a more responsive political relationship between tribes in the United States. So, so I kind of, so it's on these different scales that I'm imagining this, uh, this kind of fantasy future of how we can, you know, get to a more sane um, future. So, uh, so that's, um, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what I was thinking about for this project. And uh, and it was like, just like, okay, I'm gonna just put it out there. This is what I think based on what I know, this is what's possible. And, I, and it comes from a belief system that we can't change a future if we can't imagine it. And, um, and this is something that it, that's really, uh, it's really important for us all to think about. We can't, it's, it's, we understand the problems. We understand, uh, you know, how we are all compromised or how our futures are compromised as, uh, you know, marginalized communities, but we have to be able to imagine something different, an alternative future and speak it into being. Um, so we can't get there if we don't have a vision of the future. And that's where, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I'll stop there.
Thanks so much, Tina. Ruben, yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, <clears throat> thanks for the call. I was, I was thinking Pacific time, not Eastern time. So I'm glad somebody called me. I was just <laughs> about to head out, but I thank you. <clears throat> well, um, how I got into it? Well, it's sort of embedded in me, not sort of, it is truth, family, health, and culture is our Coast Salish law. And under those, under those are the fundamental of any religious or any spiritual belief of love and honor and respect, dignity, pride, compassion, understanding, truth, knowledge, and wisdom, bravery, and courage. Uh, those are the fundamentals. And that's what we as Tislewichith work within. And um, under, under those guidelines, we, you know, our elders had the foresight over 35 years ago to, do, to start that work. And um, what that work turned into, and it was a lot easier for us to build on what they did is we, de you know, we're stopping a pipeline. And um, a, back then it was a $350 billion company and Canada supported it, British Columbia supported it, and Alberta supported it. And so we, we, we took things in our own hands and we did our own 1200 page assessment of the, of the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline. We did multiple economic studies because we we knew the price per barrel fluctuated so much. COVID times it went below zero, and we we did we did um, spill analysis, clean analysis. We did air quality studies, all based on Tisleewitch Nation law. I was taught that my whole life. You know, um, I did family therapy before I started doing this environmental work, and I did the same thing. I hired. Um, a couple psychologists and, and 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 we work with a bunch of elders and we take any psychological program and we translate it into our own legends and stories and teachings. And that's what we did with this. With this environmental work, it was our law. It was our Tislewitith Nation law that that we developed all these studies and analysis and things like that. And um but it's not just me, it's 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 my nation, it's my family. You know, all, all my siblings, they, they do what I do, and, and they all come to ceremony. We all pray together. You know, in the wintertime, we, we pray every single day almost, and, and there's, there's about 70 of us that, that go regularly, and I, 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 I run a Sundance night, and I, um, I was adopted into two Lakota families, and, and my family come to that too. But all my nephews and nieces, my mom, she's, she's probably the biggest example of right now for us. She's, been, she's in her 80s. She's been arrested three times you know, and, and stop in the pipeline. My, my kids, um, they traveled the world. They spoke at United Nations three times each and, or no, five times each. And they continue to go where it's needed, where people need help. And we, we do share these things, you know, and um, we incorporate consistently, constantly our, our culture of truth, family, health, and culture in all the work that we do. And it's not just environment. We we incorporate these values into our housing, to economic development, to to everything. You know, we make sure that the money we make, that not one family is going to monopolize the money, that we take care of the things that we need to take care of. Our salmon count for our main river went down to 6,000 for the whole year. At one day last year, we had 1.2 million salmon in the river. This 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 um port, port where this pipeline comes out of is one of the busiest ports in North America. Everything was dying around it, but we we cleaned it to the degree that the first time in about 45 years we did a clam harvest. We reintroduced elk into our traditional territory that brought back grizzly bears and wolves and flowers and started to complete that ecosystem. We're, we're, we're in the lower mainland of Vancouver where we have the biggest solar panel farm in, in the lower mainland of Vancouver. So we we work towards all these things and, and then the success that we do have economically creates some sovereignty for us. We We created our own school based on those values, again, of truth, family, health, and culture for elementary school, for high school. We, 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 you know, made a big focus on our language and our culture and revivalization. We lost so much. To slay with Nathan Nation, we're, we're about 17,000 17, people that were wiped out down to 13. Of that 13, my mom's 82. I'm 188, but we're growing to about 600 now. And what we turned into with those values that we follow of who we are is, is creating 
you know, a, a force in Canada to make sure that when when they listen, we're the first nation in Canada that Trudeau met with when he got first in, when he first got into leadership of Canada. It's not because he wanted to. It's because we he had to because we started exercising our indigenous rights, our sovereignty over the lands and waters that we've been governing for thousands of years, and within that law. So we so we do the same thing, and, and we continue to do the same thing. You know, um, you know, with even with our business, we we got some big grants, and we're starting to move forward to creating our hydrogen energy plant here here in Vancouver. You know, one thing that I work with is um. Is, is what our ancestors did for years is using mushrooms and, and, and healing with, with psilocybin. And, and we got a $2 million grant to work with residential school survivors and second and third generation residential school survivors to help heal our people. Because it's not just the land, it's the land, it's the water, and it's the people. It's the people that we also have to heal, that we also have to create and give the freedom. Because I know when I see not only you know, in, 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 in my community, if how much growth that we had to go through, but the world needs some really growth. And it's simple to put it at, you know, a car has four tires. One could represent your physical, your mental, and your emotional, and your spiritual being. You take spirituality away. And those fundamentals that I'm talking about, even the truth, family, health, and culture, and those fundamentals of love, honor, respect, bravery, and all those good things you take, you take that away. And, and, and how is the world going to run? And it's really apparent. It's pretty wacky. Sister mentioned about the hurricanes and tornadoes and, uh, and look at the atmospheric rivers and the, and the fires. It, it doesn't look good. 70% of mammals have died. 50% of the world's species have died. Where we're going isn't good and it's, it's a lack of spirit. That's what I believe in. So side by side in the work that we do with the environment, our goal and our, our, our dream is also to help people heal. Help people heal with our, with our ancient medicines that we've been using and and, and we're moving forward and we're getting the right people in that, that you know, that want to want to heal and, and dig into the roots of who they are. Our ancestral knowledge is pretty important, but it's not just indigenous. It's, it's all every long time ago. It took 2000 years to colonizers to colonize themselves. But before they did that, they came from clans. They came from something. And there's 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 so much trauma in, in the world that a lack of spirit is a trauma in itself. And those are the things that we look at to fix. We want to fix and help people and make, uh, help people heal. And in turn, we believe we could heal our land. You know, I, I think of this. Look at, look at every single person, no matter where you're from. Think of your great grandparents and say, say, say something. They, 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 they transported themselves from the past to the future to today, how they would look at the world. How they would see what it turned into and none of them would approve of it none of them would approve of it i, I like what you said dina about changing the education system because that's where it starts we had a choice to put my kids in a private school or put them in public school and as a parent and it was a different and that's where this started to create the change to take away people's thoughts of their own individual thought <laughs> it was brutal if they say if you're really really smart you could be a doctor a lawyer in a public school but when my daughter went to that private school, she started with 32 kids and graduated at 15 to 32 kids. And, and, and every single one of those kids took political science and business. Be rich and wealthy like your parents and, and become a politician and run things in a wacky way. Disconnected. You know, they only, they only did 20, 20, 20 minutes of physical education a week because that's all they're required to. And it's all academic. But they started to change and, and, and create... With what they wanted the kids to think, and they still do that. Look, look at the people and then their individualities taken away. My son, he was funny. He's, he's smart. He's like grade two. And he said, don't make me a robot. I don't want to be a part of the school. Let me be myself. And that's what we're stuck in in the society, I, I believe. And that's what we want to fix. Because it's, 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 the environmental work is really important, but I never stopped helping. I still, I still volunteer in corrections. I still volunteer at a men's treatment program. I still volunteer at the homeless downtown east side. And the, the, we, need to, we need to do some healing, but not just us. You could look at First Nations and say, wow, that's a big problem. But that's what we could see. But I feel just as bad for somebody who's lacking spirit, not just in themselves, but for multiple generations. That's generational trauma of lacking spirit. 
And those are the types of things that will fix my nation, my family. It's all open. It's all open in, in our healing center that we're creating in the, in the $2 million grant that we got to, to help people to heal is, is a step in the right direction. But this environmental work has to be done and we can't stop. We have unlimited resources to, to, to do what they're doing. But I think the, the guiding force behind what Tsleil-Waututh -Wa Nation has been doing and how we've been creating our success is tapping into what I started with as our, as our, as our law of truth, family, health, and culture. That's what we do, and that's how we're winning, and that's how we'll win. So thank you. Thanks so much, Ruben. I, I have like 100 follow-ups I want to ask all of you, and we don't have time for that. But So I'm going to go around and ask just like one of each of you, and then we'll get into some more kind of cross-group questions. But I want to come back to Elizabeth, I think, for the first one here. And um, you can take this kind of wherever you would like to. But, I, you know, when I like when I think about your work, I often think about it's like impact on New York's energy transition, the state of New York, the city of New York. Um, also think about the work you've been involved in, in in Puerto Rico. And I wonder if you could say, if you could talk more about those projects, either in New York or the P or PR or both, how they're bound up together, how they enter into this conversation we're having around environmental justice and land-based practices and, and, and so on. Well, well, thank you for that question, because when Ruben was talking, um, he reminded me that we are winning, that uh, the solutions are being pushed by the front line, even though philanthropy and even though government thinks that it's being led by big organizations and that, uh, but the transformation is literally happening on the ground. I know in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, where I live, we've stopped the siting of a power plant, doubled the amount of open space. We are decommissioning peakers. We have a plan for the decarbonization of our community of 130,000 people. Uh, we are launching the first community on solar in the city of New York. Um, so we are leading with solutions that deal with how to build community power, how we deal with food sovereignty, how do we get access to all the things that we need. Um, and I think that that is the story that despite everything we've gone through, and we have gone through some things, uh, what Ruben was talking about, that story is an Afro-Indigenous story that is Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, which is the oldest colony in the world. Uh, it is the, the, the canary in the coal mine when it comes to extraction and the United States just having its way. There were 23 super funds in Puerto Rico, which means that when a cat five hurricane hits, all of that is dispersed into the, the, the air, the water, the, the soil, all of it, right? It is genocide. And that word is so packed. People think it's hyperbole, but it's real. And it has been going on for generations. The fact that we are here in this room talking to you able to share with you the solutions that we push is a miracle in itself. The fact that we're able to do that, uh, given the generations of toxic abuse and, and the, the emotional harm that has been done on us generation after generation. And then you pile on top of that a larger environmental conservation and policy landscape that is still by and large looking at climate change as an issue separate from humanity. Um, and one that is going to be solved through technology rather than ourselves. And, and this is what we're up against right now while we factor the newest round of climate legislation underway by the Biden administration and some state and local governments. It is the most amount of federal funding that you've ever seen on climate and energy buckets, but it holds a lot of risk in implementation because it leaves the door open for tech fixes and projects that do not start with community and environmental well-being, but with corporate po uh, profits. As if we're going to trust the sector, the fossil fuel company, the folks that put us where we are today to fix the problem. The problems are being fixed by folks like Ruben and by people in our community that are doing this work. In New York, we helped pass the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and just like last week, we were fighting the governor because while we were getting ready to get onto a meeting, she was working to try to weaken the climate law that was created to move money to the front line so that we are safe uh, from the impacts of climate change. It's, uh, it feels like we are sort of these ninja warriors that have to fight at every level. It is exhausting and it is big. Uh, and so we have to lead with these solutions because what you saw in Puerto Rico after the devastation of Hurricane Maria, earthquakes and everything that happened was people using, reclaiming their ancestral knowledge, growing their own food, 
working in what we call a just recovery to support each other and to put systems in place that would make it possible for them to decolonize Puerto Rico and move Puerto Rico on a path to sovereignty. It's what has to happen in our communities. We're talking about scale on a very local level, right? Everything from garden cooperatives to renewable energy to basically mapping all of our reef rooftops and backyards uh, so that we can find places in a densely urban environment where we can have access to renewable energy, to food and to water, the things that we need in order to survive and then create an economic system that is radically different than the one that we've inherited so that we can thrive in the face of climate change. It's exhausting. All, and that's why we need to be leaderful. That's why we need to be intergenerational, matriarchal. Um, that's why we have to work in a way that is about building just relationships with each other and engage in self-transformation uh, because we can't hold it on our own because it is massive. Um, it is causing a level of depression among our young people that I've never seen before. Uprose uh, uh, trains young people in leadership. We've sent five to Antarctica, four to the North Pole. We've held climate justice youth summits for about eight years. This is long before white youth decided that they were the leaders in the climate movement. Remember, movements in this country were led by the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, the American Indian Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock. Young people of color have always led movements in this country. And so I don't like for them to be erased because our movement is intergenerational, just like our people people are intergenerational and community is intergenerational, power is intergenerational. So I, I wanna share that because any, any construct where you've got one particular group of people leading is one that pits generations against each other. It is extractive, it is competitive, it is capitalist, it is not about, it is not about collaboration. And we need to move to a different way of working with each other. So in addition to talking about the relationships and what they should be like and how we can imagine relationships to be vastly different than the way we were conditioned to think about it, we are putting infrastructure on the ground and we are centering a just transition and we're passing legislation and trying to make sure that the money is moved to the front line so that those investments are made in our communities. And right now, because there is so much money on, on the table, so much, you know, you're talking about trillions of dollars with the IRA, it and, and money has been the root of all evil. Uh, we're seeing new problems that we had not anticipated. But I think that what's happening in Sunset Park and what Ruben has just described, this is happening in frontline communities all over the country where people, and, and the reason that ancestral knowledge is important, I think, is that we have forgotten how to do things uh, because being a success in this country means to be addicted to consumption and to be disconnected from the earth, to not know how to repurpose and reuse things the way our grandmothers used to know how to do. And so those traditions, those are the traditions that are going to save us. And so we have to reclaim them and we need to decolonize not just our relationships, but our space. We need to think about what co-governance looks like. Government is going to be disrupted by extreme weather events. Everything will be. So what does co-governance look like? Well, co-governance, that model, that lives in our Afro-Indigenous traditions. And so it really is a matter of reclaiming that. Um, and as we're thinking 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30, you know, 40 years from now. So I, I just wanna share that um, when you are feeling despair, because there are these extreme weather events and you feel like the future is dystopic, to look at what's happening in Indian country, to look at what's happening in the global Gulf South, to look at what's happening in Detroit, in Miami, in Brooklyn, New York, in the South Bronx, all over. We are literally reclaiming spaces. Um, and then the sad part, the other part of that that is dangerous for us is that the moment that we reclaim it, that we green it up and that we make it livable and more breathable, we get displaced from our own communities. Uh, and so there's almost a built-in disincentive to actually reclaim these spaces. And that's complex and it's difficult. But if we were to be in relationship with each other in a way that defies what we inherited, we should be okay. And that's the problem that 
privilege is the biggest obstacle to addressing climate change collectively. People do not want to give up power. They do not want to share resources. They are not committed to being led by the front line. Um, they want to be our saviors. They want to be contemporary missionaries. And they don't understand that we have to walk in our power if we are going to be able to take our communities out of harm's way. So I just want to share those things because sometimes it feels so overwhelming that we think that the solutions are coming from the grass tops, from big organizations when the solutions have always been held and are being led by people from the front line. Thanks so much for that, Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to come to you in just a second, Dina, but just want to draw out kind of one point there that we'll, I'm sure we will return to. Um, so many things I was going to draw out from that response, but you know, one of these around the Biden administration's climate policy is just to for all of us to remember that they have chosen the most resource intensive energy transition pathway possible. And that has obvious implications for many of the places and people that we're, we're sort of talking about over these two days and certainly on this final panel. Um, and their view of the of the sort of energy system is one where we simply substitute one fuel source for another and leave the rest of our sort of world as we know it, society as we know it, largely untouched. Um, again, has obvious implications around sort of jingoism and imperialism that um, aren't always part of these conversations. Um, they are with in these kinds of circles, but in the larger sort of energy and climate world, as Elizabeth was just sort of mentioning, um, those are things that we typically don't get into. And this isn't even getting into the fact that almost all of the Biden administration's climate policy is predicated on modeling um, that assumes a level of uh, carbon dioxide removal that is neither possible in the, in the empirical or theoretical literature. So it's a, a sort of technological fantasy that we can CDR our way through some of these problems. So I'll, I'll stop following up on, on those points there, but I'm gonna come to Dina, because I know um, I, both I personally am very curious to hear more about the Red Natural History curriculum. You know, I've, I've gone through the essay, which is incredible, and everyone here should spend time with it. Um, but you're also getting lots of questions in the chat about the, the particulars there, and I wonder, if you might help us, uh, if you might spend a little bit more time kind of enumerating um, you, like the, the way you conceptualize this curriculum for folks, like whether those are like the conceptual frameworks that you, you've built into it, the kinds of exercises, projects, et cetera, that you and your stu students have worked through, um, all of the other kind of aspects of it that, that you're, you're kind of pulling together into this RNH curriculum. Just spend some time helping us like get into that world with you. Oh, you're muted. Yep. Oh, sorry. Uh, I haven't actually created a, a curriculum, although I have created curriculum, like a lot of it. Uh, and uh, so, so, so I guess we could say that it's based on work that I have done and continue to do as as a teacher, as a writer. Um, but but what I have, what I and and really what I'm doing, like the work that I do as uh, like as a somebody who uh, as an educator who who works in a wide, very wide variety of spaces. So when I say educator, I don't just mean like going to call teaching college courses. Like the the education I do is really community based uh, and spans this wide array of kind of social spaces uh, from you know, the college classroom to working in the surf community in Southern California and, uh, and you know, all kinds of places in between. But, uh, but it's about what I'm seeing since, since my book came out four years ago, and it, it's just, it really took off. And, uh, and I've been invited into a lot of different kinds of spaces to talk about the book, to give talks, to give trainings, to give uh, just to just to talk about like some of the ideas that it introduced to people, uh, it was people are really captivated. And, and here I'm talking about non-native communities. So uh, so it, that's really the audience that I wrote that that was targeted for that book. So um, it's really about you know it's part of that education process, like making people aware that they are conditioned, they're, they're socialized in a certain kind of a way to think a certain way. And, and it's, it's a very colonized way. So you, again, you don't know what you don't know. And so what I'm doing in, when, in all these different spaces is just laying out the histories that they have been deprived of. They've, we've all been miseducated. And so, uh, so correcting those 
those educational process by just giving a, a, a history, an accurate history about American, uh, you know, the foundation of America and about colonialism and about this structure. And, and then once we, once we've got that foundation laid, we can, we can un, and unpack it, then we can re, you know, put it together put things together in a different way. And uh, and people are really captivated by understanding traditional knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge. They they are, and it's not just in my world. I, I know it from uh, people who do similar work to, to what I do. Uh, you know, Robin Wall Kimmerer, her book, Braiding Sweetgrass was like wildly popular. I mean, it's been on the New York Times bestseller list for 73 weeks. And that was that was years after it first came out. So when her book first came out in 2013, um, it didn't get the attention. You know, it took years. And, and then all of a sudden, like some kind of critical mass was, uh, you know, hit. And now it's like on the bestseller list and has been for for years. And so this is part of the, the evidence of uh, what I'm seeing for people who uh, just they they they're hungry for a different way of looking at the world. They know that indigenous people lived, you know, sustainably for uncount countless generations. So they know that these knowledge systems have built in longevity for societies. And so they're curious about it now. They're asking about it. And and so there's just so much of uh, so much of that is what they're asking me about. And uh, and so that's why I was like, okay, you know, this is I know that this is if we created some kind of curriculum, it has to be centered in indigenous worldviews, indigenous um, knowledge, indigenous environmental, uh, ecological knowledge, which is about understanding the world from a position that's really different than the extractive capitalist society that everybody's socialized into. Instead, we begin from a place of understanding the world relationally, how we as humans, we don't center ourselves. We center our relationships and, and what it means to live in balance, to live in harmony, to live um, with reciprocity and respect and responsibility, um, the, what we call the four R's. And so, and sometimes it's the five R's, it depends on who you talk to, but it's still, it's this framework of uh, a, a completely different orientation to the world um, that, that creates it's this kin-based system or kin centrism, sometimes it's called, um, that has the, the possibility for uh, for longe for longe longevity and continuity and um, and can avoid the kinds of uh, complete social collapse that we're seeing now because I think that's really what's happening. I think you know like I'm pretty like you know. Uh, I'm pretty realistic and in, in a way that's kind of cynical, but I do think that we are seeing social social decay. Uh, and so it's like, okay, if we can ex we can you know grasp that, get, you know, understand it for what it is, and then what do we do do to turn it around? And so for me, knowing what I know about indigenous knowledge systems, that it's these, these are epistemological problems to you. It's a philosophical problem. So we talk about uh, climate change and we talk about um, environmental degradation. It's not just about economics. It's not an economic problem. It's not, uh, it's not a um, technological problem. It's a philosophical problem. It's how you orient yourself to how you you imagine solutions to these problems because when you when you frame things as in a certain way and you understand these kinds of uh, worldviews it prompts you to ask different kinds of questions and th those questions will lead you to different kinds of answers so anyway that's that's a, a lot of information but uh, but when I think about curriculum, uh, that's what I think about. How do we orient people to a different way of seeing the world? Um, that's much more sane. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, Ruben, I want to come to you again next, and then I, we'll we'll get into kind of a little bit of wrapping up questions um, once once we do. But 
Um, there's so much I want to know about the the process that you and your neighbors and your your that you and your interlocutors went through in order to assemble the technical and financial and political capital you needed to 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 build all of the things you're building, both like you know building um, conceptually and power wise, and also physically building around hydrogen and the energy transition uh, around. Um, you know, your, your own sort of democratic means of doing so. So I just wonder if you could help us understand a bit more about um, how how you and, and your your you know neighbors, how you and your your um, interlocutors were able to sort of pull this incredible body of work together and to do so in a context, um, you know, in Canada <clears throat> where um, some things are better and some things are worse in terms of like the way the, the fossil fuel system and the renewable energy system kind of interact with land-based practices and politics. <clears throat> well, I'm going to say this so I don't forget. It's pretty neat. We just partnered with a company about a month ago that could take any diesel run vehicle, anything, and they could, they could change it to a, a hydrogen energy um car or vehicle and for free but the de the the deal is that they use our hydrogen for their vehicles so that's that's a pretty big big deal i think i think um like environmentally how we how we got going is um we had a meeting with a bunch of environmentalists that invited us to a meeting and they invited my elders to three of them from the three nations around vancouver and they, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll work with you, but we want to show you a little bit why. So the, our elders asked about 22 of these environmental organizations to come to ceremony for six months <laughs> before we did any work with them, just to show them why we do what we do. And it comes easy. It's like, and I, I prayed all over the world. I was lucky to do that in, in Panama, in the jungle, in Brazil, in Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. I prayed I'm lucky to pray with a lot of really good people. And, and it comes down to the same thing. It's like they all use fire for the sun, earth, water, and air in their ceremonies. And the idea is you put any of those two elements together, like a smudge. Everybody knows smudge. You, you get the earth element and the sun element, and you put it together, and smoke comes out of that. But what that represents is a spirit with intention. Like love. We all know and understand love is a spirit. Two people come together, they fall in love, and then they do a ceremony around that to honor that. And they call it marriage, every single culture. And but but trauma too. Two people could come together and could create physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, sexual trauma. Or you look at things that have a spirit when two things come together, money and people. Look at the greed, what it does to people. That's brutal. Look at alcohol could do to people. It's brutal. Two things come together and, and the negative effect come out of it so what we do in those ceremonies is we 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 showed them we showed them what spirit is we tried anyway and a lot of them i think got it but but once you start to see and to feel and to recognize and we put those fundamentals of humanity into into our ceremonies love honor respect and all those good things and then and then what happens is in ceremonies no matter how you pray or where you pray what i believe is your spirit expands to the size of the room that you're in and overlaps one another. But what that does is pushing stuff out of you that doesn't match that narrative that you set of love and honor and respect and all those things. So that was the foundation of the work that we did. And then we said, now, now we'll show you why and how we're going to create the assessment and the way we want it, working with world-renowned scientists. And we told them this too. We in, in business, we do the same thing. We sit down with potential business partners and, and we're, we're going to, looks like we're doing a trip to China to to again work with a family that we've been working with for this um, for many years now, multiple well from my grand from my uncle Len to us looks like we're going to work with them. But we when we sit down with them, we tell them we said do do you know do you know do you know the history of First Nations in, in Canada and 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 the government? Do you know about the residential schools? And whether they say yes or no or not, we we say well we're not immune to it. We were part of that colonial system that screwed everything up. And right then and there, will their reaction will dictate to us whether we'll, we'll work with them or not as a business partner. And then we we started to share each other's cultures, which is very similar to the, the people over there in China and us and the clan systems. And, and it, was, it was a really good relationship. And, and, and it was for about 10 years. Now we're looking at creating another relationship with them with hydrogen. 
and going back to that deal that we made with a, a good group that that could take any diesel vehicle and, and change it to hydrogen, it was the same thing. Because what it comes down to is is economic sovereignty to to make sure that we could go where we want, when we want, and work with who we want, and not have money be an issue, and help people. And really for real help people. Because the big problem is, is they have endless resources to do what they want to do. You know, like look at the media. Look at look at look at how they're treated. There's some some news up here in Vancouver, British Columbia that didn't do a story on us. We got picked up by El Jazeera and so I can't remember what it's called, but South American National News. We got picked up by BBC, but we didn't get picked up by a couple of the major news. Um broadcast systems here in Vancouver, because that's money. And, and then the government, that's brutal. We went to court. We went to federal court of appeal and we won. They said, yep, your evidence is right. We're going to kill the orca whales. Yep, your evidence is right. Your economic analysis is right. And Canada's wrong. But you know what? We're going to side with the best interests of Canada. They told us, the elders said that. They said, be careful this time around, because that court system is only a branch of Canada. And this is what we're up against, but we have to beat them at their own thing. You know, and that's why we go to the Kinder Morgan AGM at that time when it was Kinder Morgan. That's why we go to the banks. We talk to them and we say, hey, we're gonna stand, we're gonna stand in our sovereignty of protecting our land within our law to stop you. And we discouraged so far 22 insurance companies to back out of it. We encourage banks to back out of it. You know, that's, that's, we, we tell the truth of what we're doing. So whatever the partner is, and however how we work with it, we tell them our goals and our visions and our dreams, whether it's business or economic development or to create hydrogen. You know, the pollution that comes out of it is water. <laughs> it's like ridiculous. We're not doing that. Look at the I have to, panels. Ruben, I'm going to disagree with you. I feel, I feel, I feel like I'm well, jumping I, out. I, 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 I'm it, jumping it, out of my seat here. Were we, were we, were we make? You could disagree, but this is our goal and our vision, our dream. Hydrogen, hydrogen, the energy that we make from it is 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 from hydro. It's from yeah, water. I, I don't know whose goal and dream that is, but in the climate justice movement, uh, we oppose geoengineering and we oppose these in, these uh, false solutions like carbon sequestration and green hydrogen and there are millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, being proposed by the fossil fuel industry to go into this area um and the money that's is true. not enough that's true. i mean we're that's really why, talking about you're talking about great green gray energy you're then, talking about gray energy that we don't approve of too we're, we're talking about green, green energy, hydrogen green, green yes that's what we're talking about so right and so we, that's, have, that's we why, have a problem with that because, hydro is is water energy that's that's creating the hydrogen energy for us. And it is a problem because the fossil fuel industry, they sell their energy of, of hydrogen cheaper, but we're still doing it anyway. We're still doing it anyway ethical and, and we're taking that risk, but it's a risk worth worth taking. And we do have partners doing that. So, you, you know, you, you disagree, but it's it's green energy creating hydrogen energy. That's what it is. Yeah, but there, you know what? This is an unproven methodology. Um, it's literally speculative. It's profit driven. We it's have a proof fixes. of concept of Prince George. And we, and, and we have, we, and we have papers this. and scientists with the hydro stuff. We've got the folks in Hydro Quebec and the indigenous people concerned about what that's what is going to do to disrupt its ecosystem. So, and these are fossil fuel companies that are going to make a well, lot of profit out of this. No, that's okay. Then I'll take care of that too. The nations that we're looking at to work for have their own hydrogen dam that they approved of for their land that created it to be safe that we want to buy their hydrogen hydro energy from. But not all we indigenous cover, people are in agreement bases. with so you. Before Ruben. you disagree and jump in on what I'm doing, then, you know, <laughs> it's pretty important. But I would ask you to do is to talk to the Indigenous Environmental Network and other indigenous people throughout the country that we are working with that oppose these as false solutions. So it's, maybe, it's, because it's, I don't it's, think, it's, when it's you say- gray. I, I don't we, agree with gray energy really, myself. When you say we, you have to be real specific because it, I don't want viewers, I don't want people who are in this room to think that as a climate justice movement that we're all in agreement with these interventions. And, and I, I agree with what you're talking about and that's the gray, gray energy hydrogen. 
Well, what we're doing is green energy hydrogen. So I think there's maybe a way for us to, to talk about this um, in, in the context of, of land-based practice and conservation too. Um, so I want to I want to pull us into that conversation a bit as well. So um, as we think about some of the different interventions that Ruben, you know, I think laid out for us here, um, we can also maybe think about those alongside some of what are often called natural climate solutions, right? These are the things that are favored by um, not only some big greens, but also the Davos World Economic Forum, ExxonMobil, the Trump oh. administration, and so hey, can on. I, right? can, I, can I say one more thing about that, too? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about we, hydrogen, we, but yeah, we, we can talk we about have, that if you want. What we have in, in, our, in our projections for one year, two year, three year, is also to create energy off of waste, human waste, off sewage. And that's a proof of concept that's that's already happening. So, you know, we, we think of those things. Yeah, I, I think, this, so this is hopefully a way for us to talk some more about those, right? So I, I don't actually know what the right question is here to ask, right? But I think when we think about these different forms of natural climate solutions or so-called natural climate solutions, whether they're tree planting programs, um, whether they're questionable sort of energy technology programs, and I'm not even thinking of hydrogen per se, you, I'll, I'll let Ruben and Elizabeth um, go back and forth on that, but I'm thinking of CDR technology, which, you know, um, has only ever been commercially successfully used for one thing, and that's to pull more oil and gas out of the ground. Um, I just wonder what, if you could help us like situate some of these, how you, how you all think about in your work, this constellation of so-called natural climate solutions, which ones make sense for us to continue sort of pushing into this conversation about unfencing con conservation, and which ones maybe don't belong in that conservation or are contested enough that we can set them aside for a moment and focus on other things where perhaps there is broader agreement within the CJ movement as has as been kind of articulated here. So I'll, I'll stop talking there. We don't have an order for this question, but I'll, I'll let you all kind of jump back in as you would like to. Well, like you said, I, I, we, we look at very carefully what, what is going to create the no harm to the work that we're already doing. And we, we have a, we have a, one, two year, three year phase out system. And, and we, we, there's a lot of human waste that's going through. And that's how we want to create energy as well to create this hydrogen energy. And, and you know, it's like, everything's not perfect. I'm, and, and I'm proud of the fact that Sisleywood's nation moved forward and creating solar panels, but that's not perfect in itself. <laughs> but are we going to stick with what, what isn't? Like gas and oil and coal? Like we, we, we need those solutions. We, we need to move forward and find, find a way. And we're always open. We're always open. If they want to give me a call, yeah, we're happy to talk to them and explain our processing of what we're doing. It's too important not to do nothing, but to stop what's existing because we need, the, we need to feed them alternatives. And that's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. The, the choices in between uh, techno fixes that literally are based on extraction and harm frontline communities and create sacrifice zones and doing nothing, that, that those aren't the choices. There's all of this work that is happening in between that is being held by frontline communities all over the country. And so it, it, that that is that to say nothing compared to extraction there's a whole world between that where we're working to decarbonize our communities we're passing legislation we're putting down infrastructure in new york city we just literally made it possible after a seven-year fight against industry city in in brooklyn that was trying to turn the industrial waterfront into a recreation location we fought to make sure that we engage in a green reindustrialization and that we're building for climate adaptation mitigation and resilience and that we were able to bring offshore wind to south to the south, south brooklyn marine terminal so the solutions are both small scale like community owned solar initiatives to large scale, you know, to try and make sure that we have green manufacturing in our communities so that we can build for that climate future. So it's a, it's it's more complex than what the fossil fuel companies are telling us and trying to scare us out of desperation uh, to support their tech fixes and no, no action. We are taking action on every level from city state legislation, even Justice 40, and even what is happening on a national level is 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 based on the legislation that we passed in New York, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. It's a washdown version. It's a washdown version because they're playing footsie with the fossil fuel companies, right? And so with the IRA funding, they give us funding 
And then at the same time, they are funding the fossil fuel industry. Um, and we are not at that place right now where we can compromise justice anymore. During the civil rights movement, there were a lot of compromises to make the privilege comfortable with the pace at which change was taking. And so that compromise, that compromise took lives. And right now, my dogs are barking. I'm sorry, they're so upset because they know that I'm upset. Uh, so uh, right now, the IPCC just told us we have seven years. And so we have seven years and where's where it coming from? It's going to the go south. It's going to the people who are not responsible for creating climate change. And what are we gonna do? We're going to trust the people who put us in this position uh, with their tech solutions that ends up generating tons of income for them? Or are we going to support the kind of frontline solutions that, that are a just transition, that move us away from fossil fuel extraction and address things like renewable energy, food sovereignty, drinkable water, and wellness, the things that our communities need to thrive and to survive. The economy is not gonna be the same. And for us to think that we want lots of money, this economy is what got us here. We're gonna have to say that capitalism is killing the freaking planet and that we're gonna have to move away from it whether we like it or not. I don't come from money. I don't come from money. I've never had things. Of course, I would love to have things, but you know what? Climate change is telling us we're gonna have to live with what we need and not with what we want and that we're gonna to have to embrace different kinds of economies. And I, and the people that I run with, don't wanna do it with the fossil fuel companies. They just cannot be trusted to look out for the front line of the climate crisis. So Ruben, I have a lot of respect for you. You've been doing God's work. So please don't take this personally, but we have a completely different philosophical uh, understanding of what they're doing. And we have been in meetings with them. Uh, we have, we do our due diligence, by the way. We don't just react to things. We do a lot of research. We get our policy people from all over the country to break it down and find out what does it mean for Guam? What does it mean for Alaska? What does it mean for Detroit? What does it mean for Puerto Rico? What does it mean for our frontline communities in West Virginia who are doing mountaintop removal? And then we decide whether or not the policy is going to benefit our community. We're not some fringe group of people who just dismisses something because it's coming from the fossil fuel company because we want to be in relationship with businesses. We want to work with a multiplicity city of stakeholders that are about moving us away from harm. So I just want to say that because it's easy to write us off and say, okay, we are either no solution or those or those solutions. No, we're much more complex yeah. about that. And, and, our, and our fingerprints are all over the place. Even with the Green New Deal, when the Green New Deal popped on, on social media, we met with AOC and we said, how is it centering a just transition? How are we making sure that frontline solutions or is this a grass tops created construct? And then we were able to support it. So we take a, a moment to really examine whether or not we these, rec these recommendations that we meet with engineers, we meet with regulators, with planners, with scientists, because it's our people, it's our abuelas, it's our families that are on the line. So I don't, well, want, that, people, I don't want people like, to think I'm just reacting. But that's the thing, like, this is really a matter, this is a matter of tribal sovereignty. That's, this is where I stand on this. Like for, for Ruben's community, they have identified a solution that works for them. And you can, you can, you know, disagree with it or disagree with it. But what they're doing is on their land. It's a matter of their sovereignty and the choices that they make. It's not going to, you know, impact your community in Brooklyn. They're going to have to live with, with the choices that they make, you know, the, the good, the bad and the ugly. And so uh, I understand and this that, is, Dina, this, and I agree. This, I, I respect true, and agree. The same is true. Uh, you've gotten to speak. Now, let me speak. So the same is true, even for the tribes in the United States who are doing fossil fuel extraction and making lots of wealth, gaming, whatever it is that they're making money from. I don't like that. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think that it's smart to be to be, you know, fracking your your land. And if you look at uh, Fort Berthold, that's the that's the poster child for like what not to do to your land. And so, you know, but it's their land, like they're the ones that are going to have to live with it and, and the consequences and the and the the generational damage that it's going to do. But it's they they are a nation that has the power to do what they need to do what they want to do and they'll have to to live with the consequences of it. And so uh so this is this is my stand on it. I agree with you. I, I want to say I agree you with know, you. I just yeah, I, my I big my big concern, Zina, is that there are people listening 
who may listen to one indigenous person and think that they're speaking for indigeneity across the country and that's not true and so you're i just want it i want it so i want it yeah and you're i agree and and he has the right to do that with all due respect with all due love and respect you're absolutely right about that but because the people who are listening yeah, may not some, necessarily be from there i thought it was important you, you you said a lot and and i have to reply to it for sure you know we we were, we were part of the second best selling wood temper company wind turbine company in canada at one time like i said our movement with with our solar energy and we do our due diligence just like we did a 1200 page assessment on the kinder morgan tmx pipeline and all the work that we did that's what we did with this too that's what we do with this too we looked at hydrogen we looked at the problems that are around it we looked at solutions that wouldn't harm and create some green energy i don't know i don't like hydrogen we we make the energy out of hydrogen hydro energy, which is water energy. And I explained, and I and I feel I don't even have to, but I explained already that the energy that we're going to create of human waste is always also going to give energy to create the hydro hydrogen energy. So I you know it's 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 weird that having this discussion when we're moving towards a solution. Well, so. Uh, so yeah, not, I don't want to cut you off, Ruben, because I think this we could talk about this for the rest of the night, and I actually would would love to do that. But we're very tight on time; we have a couple minutes left, and I want to maybe end us on. Um, you know, we've had the, we've had a conversation here about some of the things we maybe disagree about, but I want to maybe talk at the just to like a lightning round here at the very end, um, just a, a minute or so each. If you could maybe talk through this kind of sense of division between you know, urban and rural places in, let's say, North America um, or the Americas, um, and the way that those are are bound up in some of these conversations we're having in the energy system and climate change. And um, rather than focusing on things we maybe don't agree about, or, or, or maybe focusing on things we disagree about um, on the tech side, I wonder if we could talk through how some of the work you're doing, how some of the work that is to come um, might help us bridge some of those divides between urban and rural places and people. Um, one that sort of centers environmental justice um, in in a bunch of different frameworks that touch many different aspects of the built and natural environment. So uh, I'm just wondering, this is basically a question of me asking you, like, what's what's keeping you going? What's giving you the the power you need to keep doing this work that you know is going to lead us to a place that we've been talking about in kind of abstract terms um, for the last hour or so? Um, and Ruben, I, I cut you off, so I feel like I maybe should come to you first here to kind of begin to wrap us up. If you're okay jumping in on that question, sure. Um, I don't know. We we just do people going in the same direction. We'll we'll work with. We work with the Wisowitan. We we work with the chiefs of the Wisowitan that are protecting against the LNG plant. We work with, and they're remote. They're they're pretty not too far from Alaska. You know, in Britain, Central British Columbia, we work with um, Kenny Hughes and the Tiny House Warriors. But also we work with Washington State Tribes. We work with NGOs. There, there's about 80, 80 First Nations tribes and NGO organizations that we continuously work with. We work with people that are going in the same, that are on the same page and going in the same direction. We do that internationally. You know, we work with people in South, Central, and North America. We, we work with people globally that are going in the same direction, the same goals, same visions, same ideas. So um, I think there's no barriers between us as a as an urban nation working with our, the nations that are in remote areas for us like we're always willing and able and capable of, of, of working we work with um, coastal first nations with seven tribes we work with um anybody anybody reaches out and wants to move in that direction we for sure will we'll do we'll do our best to accommodate and work with people and share what we have i think all, a lot of the work that we did was was precedenting that we we shared as much as with, with it with indigenous people globally. We, you know, I traveled the world a lot sharing this in remote places and different places. We did a tour, for example, of Panama, where um, my uncle took the East Coast, I took the West Coast, and we worked with all the major chiefs of, of the tribes in that country. So um, we just do our best, and we have a good team, a couple policy analysis, a couple um, good lawyers that we work with. We have a lot of good spokespeople that we work with that that reach out far. It's not just me. It's I have a really, really good team that that makes me look good, and and they they do amazing good work. And we're always always willing to reach out and to work out and try to help people that are going in the same page in the same direction. 
Thanks. Thanks so much, Ruben. Um, Elizabeth, why don't we come to you and then we'll I'll go to Dina here to to end us and I'll I'll just say a quick goodbye once we do. So Elizabeth, yeah, please go ahead. Sure. I just really uh, want to say Ashe and thank everyone for listening to this conversation and all the panelists. Um, this is an example of the tensions that exist in our communities that were created for us. Um, I come to this with deep love and deep solidarity and deep respect. I am a warrior. I manifested as one. I am a woman of Afro, Afro Indigenous ancestry. That's how I grew up. I didn't just have a wake, a woke moment and and heard a poem and decided that I was that. That's how I grew up. Um, and um, and so I come to this with um, resistance, love and resistance. I, I want to make sure that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, that we have honored our ancestors, that we are walking in our power, that we are not compromising the lives of our people for the dollar, uh, that my child uh, has a, a life that he can live without fear. Um, and so that's that's where I, that's where I come from. Um, I don't mind being corrected. I don't mind changing my mind. I am flawed. Um, I am a descendant of colonialism, and so that happens. Uh, but what I won't do is compromise the future uh, of 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 our people. I will fight for that. And so I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. And I want to say to folks that were listening that I don't. I have no disrespect and mean no disrespect for anyone. Um, I really think that we have inherited mess. And sometimes we have to engage in messy conversations uh, because what's in front of us is very messy. Um, climate change is not nine to five. It's a life. It's not even a job. And so, um, and so, yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm here to fight for my people. And, and, uh, and I'm really, really grateful uh, for the opportunity to share uh, my thoughts today. Thanks so much. And Dina, yeah, over to you. Okay, last word. Um, what keeps me going? Um, you know, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just st stubborn, I guess. <laughs> I just fight. I, I'm a fighter. I mean, I was born fighting, I think. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I feel like a salmon, you know, I come from salmon people. And I feel like a salmon swimming upstream all the time, always saying things that, that uh, not everybody wants to hear. And uh, uh, I live in a place that's, you know, has some of the most profound indigenous erasure uh, in the country in coastal Southern California. I mean, it, the, the, the erasure has been, has been almost complete. Um, and so that's the, that's the upwards, you know, the upriver battle that I, or the upriver swim that I'm doing all the time. And, uh, you know, doing the work of what I call unerasing. Um, and that's my accountability to the to the indigenous communities on whose land I live. So um, I'm always bringing this idea of like, who are we accountable to? Um, we're accountable to these different constellations of communities. And um, I want to be in good relationship with the communities uh, that I in, inhabit and whose lands I live on. And so I do it. I do what I do you know, it, with them in mind and also with the land in mind, like how do we all learn to be in good relationship with, with the environment, with the ocean? Uh, and so the work that I'm doing these days is around ocean conservation and working with ocean conservation groups, um, the people who are uh, lovers of the ocean, who inhabit ocean spaces and um, and who don't understand their history and, and indigenous history. And so uh, so, so that's that's what keeps me going right now. That's most of the work that I'm doing, and uh, um, you know, we all just need to remember that we are all living on somebody else's land, and people, uh, people sacrificed um, for for everybody's privilege to live on that land, and so that's um, that's that's what I'm thinking about. This is that's the perfect place for us to end this, and so I'm not going to spoil that by trying to add anything here, other than to thank the three of you for a remarkable conversation and, and lots of patience with me and everyone else. So thank you, Ruben, Elizabeth, Dina, thank you so much for, for today and for everything else that you're doing. I wanna thank Steve and, and Becca and Kel and Andrea and everyone involved in kind of managing the last couple of days, certainly this, this particular panel today, um, pulling the dossier together, which was a Herculean multi-year effort that I know Steve uh, spent probably more time than he wanted to on. Um, and with that, I, I'm going to close just by thanking everybody else, too, for, for joining us um, for this session, for whatever of the last couple of days you caught. Um, it's been such a joy for me to be able to, to learn from all of you. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to, I think all of us, all the, the, this panel can disappear. Um, and I see Becca has appeared on our screen. So I will throw it over to you, Becca, to, to take us home. Well, uh, thank you, Billy. And thank you, Elizabeth, Ruben, and Dina. I, um, I'm really uh, so happy you could join us today and have this challenging conversation. We knew it would not be an easy one to land the plane after a two-day symposium with uh, these very difficult and thorny questions about what we do in the context of overlapping uh, multiple intensifying uh, crises, economic, climate, environmental, extinction crises that we face. Um, so I, I do love what you posted, Ruben, that we're going in the same direction. Uh, and, and that um, I think we, we heard a recurring theme over the last uh, two days um, around incommensurate ways of seeing, understanding, and relating to the land and each other, one based on a logic of extraction and enclosure and exploitation, um, and the other based on principles of respect and reciprocity and collective care of generations, past, present, and future of humans, non-humans, the water in the land. Um, so uh, we are drawing to a close. Thank you everybody for coming and for sticking it out. Um, I am going, we do have a video poem that I'm hoping uh, you'll stay for, but first I just wanna offer some thanks uh, and appreciation. Um, first to all of our Red Natural History fellows who served as moderators and speakers during the symposium. Um, and then I also want to thank all of our presenters um, for offering their time, their stories, their insights. Um, you will be getting a survey from us um, via Zoom, and we would greatly appreciate if you would spend a few minutes, I think it's actually going to pop up in your browser when you leave, um, to give us some feedback so we have a sense of how this all landed um, with you, uh, what you appreciated, what you wish we'd have done differently. Um, we are constantly learning and um, and appreciate that. Uh, some credits. I, I want to thank uh, Hester Dillon again, plugging her report on fencing the future, uh, which is about breaking down silos. We've heard a lot about silos over the last couple of days um, and how important it is to build and cultivate relationships, respectful relationships with each other uh, for, on a nation to nation level and with the land itself. Um, I wanna thank also our co-sponsors and partners at Survival International and the Center for the Humanities at CUNY Graduate Center. Um, tomorrow, they are hosting a, another conference on decolonizing conservation, this one focused on the global scale. So we are co-sponsoring that. We would love for you all to check that out at ourlandournature.org. I also want to thank our team at the Natural History Museum, Andrea Rollison, Jason Jones, Steve Lyons, our event tech, Cal Moody with Alluvium Gatherings, uh, our designers, Christian Fleming and Josh Yoder. Um, I invite you to learn more about the Natural History Museum uh, at our site, thenaturalhistorymuseum.org. We develop traveling museum exhibitions, award-winning films, advocacy campaigns, and alliance building events. Um, publishing projects, curatorial work, uh, and we produce social practice art activism projects. So um, join our email list if you'd like to learn more. So I'm going to bring it to a close. Yesterday, Sadie Olson opened the symposium um, with some words and a blessing and a song. Uh, she is a student uh, and a co-founder of White Swan Environmental, and we thought it fitting today to draw this symposium to a close as we're thinking about generations past, present, and future, uh, in particular, the future generations who are set to inherit um, what we leave behind. So we're gonna close with Sadie's mother, Shirley Williams. She's the executive director of White Swan Environmental, and this is her video poem. I am from medicine people. Thanks everyone. I am from medicine people. 
I am from El Langanuk, the ancestral homelands of the saltwater salmon people. From the place where the Creator threw the stones and created the islands for our people. From the place where the Creator threw the stones and our people returned to the ancestral homelands. Learning from the homeland, that is my favorite childhood place, past, present, future. I am from the beginning of time where there is the color of peace and renewal and the end of time where there is the color of sacrifice, sorrow and suffering. Going full circle to the dimensions of physical, spiritual, mental and emotional, I wipe my tears, clear my ears, clear my throat, my heart, my hands, my feet. I straighten my homelands, restore my good mind, and be fair to all people, for place is where health begins. I am from a physical world of cultural, spiritual genocide, marginalization, ethnic erasure, and historical trauma from bystander effect. I am from the blood of the millions forgotten in the name of discovering the Americas and from the acquired power of those who state they do not understand indigenous public health. I am from generations placed within borders, within borders, within borders. Be invisible, be silent, appease. I am what CNN calls something else. I'm from the spiritual world of the Swan Clan, Chief Seattle, House of the Seven Brothers, Huech, Sihom, Lord Jim Bulge, House of Discanum. I'm from a family that remembers our sacred gifts and responsibilities. From Kusamat and Sali Etseshwala, the spirit of the reef net, the teardrop of the mountain. I'm from the lineage of elders who have told me since I was a child, remember who you are and where you come from. And to believe with male and female balance, we have direct connection to the creator. And there is magic in your word. I am from the deep, dark secret of a government who used religion to kill the Indian and save the man. I am from truth and healing. I am from resilience. I am from medicine people. I am from the sacred birthplace of Mother Earth. And I am from the DNA of the saltwater salmon people. And our food is our medicine. It is sacred. It is our wealth and it is our help. I am from the red paint, a lineage of medicine men and medicine women, spiritual workers since time immemorial. And in this moment, I invite you to hold the sacred space and energy of our ancestor, Mother Earth. So together, we can transform the logic, culture, an epistemic injustice of a modern world system that brought us to this global health crisis. Release the illusion and share in the magic of our word.
Careful moment.